When you have a productivity surge like we are having right now, you can have the economy continue to be fairly strong while inflation continues to moderate. I don't understand the sticky inflation argument. If there is still a recession at some point, the market hasn't priced it. All of the ingredients are kind of there for a sustained expansion of the U.S. economy. It really does boil down to that we are simply not slowing down. Where is the slowdown? It feels like we're in that kind of sweet spot of benign disinflation and Goldilocks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. A double dose of Chairman Powell coming right up, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz, together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P positive by a third of 1%. Two-day losing streak on the S&P 500 at the close yesterday. The biggest one-day loss on the S&P since the middle of February. On the Nasdaq 100, the biggest one-day move lower since the end of January. Bramo, we've got Chairman Powell Volume 1 and Volume 2 in the next 24 hours. So before we get to Powell, I just have to say about the sell-offs you were talking about. Is that a viable dip? Does that even count as a dip? This is sort of some of the conversation that we're going to be having with Jay Powell. The question really is whether his threshold has changed with the January CPI really concerned him in a way that it seems to be concerning the market. We said on this program yesterday that the week began at 10 a.m. Eastern time yesterday, and it really did. The services ISM came out weaker than expected, but the employment component of that, yeah. the appetizer for the payrolls report, back into negative territory. 48 from 50.5. And this, I think, is what really got people alarmed. Even though when you take a look at some of the business orders and things, there are some more positive kinds of signs. If the employment is weaker, this speaks to the suspicion that so many people have raised on this show. Things are weaker than they seem. Take a look at hours being worked. Take a look at some of the other indicators. It's not that great. And this maybe gave them some fuel. It's early days, but so far, February has not confirmed January going into payrolls Friday. Before we get to payrolls Friday, we need to talk about Super Tuesday and Reality Check Wednesday for Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, she's basically, Jonathan, at this moment, undecided what she's going to do in the sense that her campaign put out a statement that seems still very combative, talking about unity that is just not there within the Republican Party. She didn't have any campaign events last night. She didn't come out to speak. The question is whether or not she will remain in this race. She did win one state, we should note. Obviously, we knew what the Super Tuesday was going to be. It was anticlimactic. It's Trump and Biden. Both of them are set by the end of the month to shore this up. But Nikki Haley did win one state, which shows Trump still has work to do ahead of November. Here's the reporting for The Wall Street Journal. Just drop in. Nikki Haley plans to suspend her Republican presidential primary bid in a speech Bramo later this morning. Which uh, some people have been waiting for. The key question now is, will she endorse Donald Trump for president? Because if she doesn't, does that create a problem for him, given the fact that he's having trouble swaying some of the moderate voters? This would create a problem for him. Um, and interesting, that's what she's going to be doing today. Because to encompass the entire Republican Party, you know, if you look at some of these numbers, he is still losing 20, 30, even 40 percent in some states to Nikki Haley. To encompass the entire Republican Party, he needs to bring in some of those either fiscally conservative individuals, more moderate Republicans. So I imagine he is going to want her endorsement. Notably, last night, he didn't mention her name. He pivoted directly to Biden in the presidential election. If you are just joining us, hardly a shocker. Hearing from the Wall Street Journal right now, according to people familiar with her plans, speaking to the journal, Nikki Haley plans to suspend her Republican presidential primary bid in a speech later on this morning. More on that a little bit later. If you are just joining us looking for some price action, this is what it looks like on the S&P 500. Equity futures on the S&P positive by around about a third of 1%. Into the bond market, yields yesterday lower. This morning, a little bit higher by not even a basis point, 4.15%. 84 on a 10 year. Coming up this hour, Liz Ann Saunders, a charge swap as mega cap tech slumps ahead of Chairman Powell's first day on Capitol Hill. We'll catch up with Greg Valier of AGF Investments as Donald Trump absolutely dominates Super Tuesday and Nikki Haley heads to the exit. And Leland Miller of China Beige Book as the country looks to defend a lofty 5% growth target. We begin with our top story, markets bracing for day one of Chair Powell testimony on Capitol Hill. And U.S. equities looking to bounce back after a sell-off across mega cap tech. Liz Ann Son is a charge swap warning to diversify from the MAG7 saying, quote, yes, the stocks are over-owned and richly valued, but all or nothing makes less sense than periodic rebalancing in the interest of keeping concentration risk in your own portfolios at bay. There is a wide array of stocks stealthily performing better this year. Liz Ann, I'm pleased to say, joins us here in New York. Liz Ann, it's been way too long since we've done I, this in person. I don't, I don't think we even heard the word 
never heard of the word COVID the last time I was here with you guys. So I am so happy to be here. And we're happy to leave that in the past as yes. well. <laughs> Let's talk about the market in front of us. Tech has been absolutely dominating. We've seen some weakness start to appear in the so-called MAG7. What's the signal you're taking away from the recent price action? Well, I've been saying that Yes, it's a bull market, but it, but it looked maybe more of a duck market. You know, the old Michael Caine line of, you know, calm on the surface and, you know, paddling like the Dickens underneath. And there has been a lot of churn underneath. But you've had these interesting breakouts in areas that have been outside the uh, sort of dominant conversation, like industrials, even within financials. And it's not really just a, a large to small. I just think that there's there are a lot of investors and there's a lot of money that seems to be itching to find opportunities outside of those uh, dominant names, which aren't as dominant anymore. Um, they're not even the seven largest stocks anymore. Tesla's been leapfrogged. A Tesla got hit. The likes of Apple have been hit. The moves you're seeing elsewhere, is it sufficient support to support the index, given the weightings? Um, it's a start. If we have to remember, if you go back to October of 2022, not last October, but, you know, the low, um, that was that was a, a, a week, a day marked by the indexes taking out their prior June lows. And memories are short, but that the indexes were weighed down by many of the same names that supported the indexes on the way up. But that October low in 2022, you had much improved breath under the surface. And that's not a bad thing to see. You know, the whole general soldiers analogy, even if, if some of the generals have kind of moved away from the front, if you've got more soldiers uh, moving up. I still think you want to stay up in quality, um, particularly smaller, less well-capitalized companies, the zombies companies are at the mercy of what goes on with interest rates, obviously. But I, I think it's all else equals uh, uh, a decent sign for the market. Yesterday was fascinating to me. As John said, in some ways, the day started, the week started at 10 a.m. when we got ISM services, yeah. and it came out. Headline number, weaker than expected. And bonds bid, stocks sold off. This is bad news is bad news. And that seems to be a new dynamic. Do you think that right now the best case for stocks might be the Fed not cutting rates because the economy is just too strong and they can keep zipping along? Well, I, no, I think you're probably right. And that's not a prospective thing. That, to some degree, is what has happened. The, the, this notion that the market has been solely moving based on the prospects for Fed cutting, yet we've gone through this pattern of, of taking March off the table, maybe even taking May off the table, shrinking the rate cuts, down to uh, three or so, consistent with the Fed. I I'm not sure that the market isn't still over its skis with regard to that. But I think you might be right. There's, there's the nuance of more significant weakness, especially if it shows up in things like employment, which we'll have to see what Friday brings, but you certainly saw it in the, uh, in the isms. We came into this week asking, what's the most important thing? It's a big week on many fronts. We get the State of the Union on Thursday. We get the jobs report on Friday, a host of talk from Jay Powell. Jim Karen of Morgan Stanley came out yesterday with a paper where he said, fiscal policy is likely to be more important than monetary policy and explained why he likes stocks because of the fiscal kind of push to stocks, but doesn't like bonds because that's going to be hammered by some of the growth and some of the price to perfection kinds of aspects. Do you agree that really it is the fiscal that's driving a lot of the growth right now and the future upside to some of the equities? I would maybe replace a lot with some. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the fiscal impulse is there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it uh, an extraordinarily high amount of credit for the strength in the economy. I think it's the the labor market, of course, just consumption is 68 percent of GDP, so that that's going to be the big driver. I think what's most important this week is not the jobs report from a headline perspective, but the innards of the jobs report. To your point, Lisa, the, the metrics like hours work, the differential between the establishment survey and the household survey, what you pick up in the household survey in terms of, you know, full time versus part time. Is it more uh, part time for economic reasons? The labor force participation rate. So I, I think it's, you know, fine tooth comb analysis time in terms of a lot of these data points. And this is what Constant Hunter of Macro Policy was talking about just yesterday. Hours worked. Hours worked. If you want a sneak peek of the payroll survey here at Bloomberg, still 200K, the median estimate in our survey at the headline number. Do you imagine, Bramer, that comes in a little bit going into Friday after that read yesterday? 
you know, this is the confusion. Some people say it's a head fake. This You can't trust one data point. Other people saying expect hours to actually tick upward because it was a seasonal issue back in January. So you know, I've read reports basically that are completely at odds and that basically leave me no the wiser. Lizanne, it's been amazing to see. The last jobs report was 353, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Reprice the Fed aggressively, equity markets held up. I'm going to build on Lisa's question. Are we basically overestimating or have we overdone the importance of monetary policy to this equity market, given what's developed in the last two months? Um, maybe, but I, I think, I, first of all, I think the Fed's in a little bit of a pickle here. Um, I, it, they're, they're trying to sort of nuance things around long and variable lags. I thought it was interesting when not so much the last FOMC meeting and the press conference, but the subsequent 60 Minutes interview when Powell, instead of emphasizing rates of change like the three-month change in inflation or the six-month, he cited the 12-month change. And that might have been a more quantitative way to say, we're not ready yet. We want to give this a little bit more time. And in the case of you know, core PCE and core CPI, on a 12-month change basis, they're not anywhere near the Fed's target. And with the three-month and six-month having hooked up back again, you've got the likelihood of that 12-month turning back up. What would you expect from him today? I always sort of frame this as a grilling on Capitol Hill. Then I have to remember that sometimes it's not. And it's just well, hours it's, and hours of political testimony it, from, it is. from, from the lawmakers. The soapboxes are everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, you put a microphone so in clean. front of them. And, you, you, you know, as an observer, you think, is there a question anywhere? <laughs> anywhere in here, is there a question? <laughs> So, and, you know, given that it's in advance of the, the jobs report, it's in advance of next week's CPI, PPI, I don't expect anything to be terribly market moving. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if, assuming it gets to the part where they ask them questions, um, they'll probably bring politics into the mix and ask about the election and... Well, what I find interesting is that both you have Republicans and Democrats kind of pushing for rate cuts, actually, more aggressively, for different reasons right. and in different ways. And at the same time, they're trying to message inflation. So we're going to get another kind of 60-minute speech from him, where he basically comes out and says, people are feeling pain. I understand that pain. We're being disciplined. Or does he come out and say, look, the market conditions actually do matter, and we're taking that into effect, which is essentially what a lot of people want to hear. I think market conditions matter, but one of the things that, that Powell has emphasized, less so recently, but I remember I attended that sort of infamous lunch that he did, I think it was in December of 2018 at the Economic Club of New York. And it was the, what everybody focused on was that he, he backpedaled from what he had said in s September of that year. But he specifically said something I thought was more interesting, which is the uh, essentially the Fed's job is not to step in because of financial market volatility. If it threatens financial system stability, that's something different. But I, I think he tried to squash the notion of the Fed put simply specific to, say, the stock market going down. Again, unless it starts to be a concern about the financial system and or its uh, plumbing. So it'll be interesting to see if he uh, makes any comments of that ilk today. Lizanne, it's great to have you with us. You're going to stick with us. The brilliant Lizanne Sanders there of Charles Swab. Just to get you up to speed on some news. So the Wall Street Journal moments ago reporting that Nikki Haley plans to suspend her Republican presidential primary bid in a speech later on this morning. Just confirming here at Bloomberg, Anne-Marie, we will get those remarks in Charleston at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Reading through this Wall Street Journal report, Jonathan, though, Haley won't announce an endorsement Wednesday, so she's going to still stay on the sidelines. But it is important for Trump that she drops out because she's still bringing in campaign money, and he wants to make sure that money comes to him. When you look at November, the war chest that President Biden is able to amass versus Donald Trump, and he's using a lot of this money to pay off his legal fees, with her out of the race, that potentially loosens up some of these donors to pivot to him, and he can really start to ramp up. Greg Vallier of AGF Investments joining us on this story in just a couple of minutes' time. Equity futures right now on the S&P, positive by a third of 1%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. President Joe Biden and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump, even more clearly now, are set for a rematch in the general election after the pair swept Super Tuesday primary polls. GOP challenger Nikki Haley managed only a token victory in Vermont overnight, leaving former President Trump with a lion's share of Republican delegates. And as you were saying, the Wall Street Journal did report that Haley plans to suspend her campaign in a speech later this morning, making that tie-up even more clear.
Bloomberg has learned that the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, plans to cut two percentage points off the national insurance tax when he unveils his budget today. That's despite Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's preference for more expensive cuts to income tax. Now, Hunt's going to deliver his budget statement later in this morning. Morgan Stanley has laid off about 9% of its asset management business unit in China. That's according to Reuters. The headcount reductions are said to have started in December. They'll impact only about 15 employees. But China's economy has been facing multiple headwinds from the real estate slump to geopolitical tensions. All of that means that there's pressure on its markets and its $3.8 trillion fund sector. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. Coming up next on this program, Donald Trump absolutely dominating on Super Tuesday. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. This is a big one. If this was an amazing night, an amazing day. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Chairman Powell coming up a little bit later this morning. Here are the scores for you on the S&P 500. Equity futures positive by 0.4%. Yields higher by almost the basis point, 416 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, Donald Trump absolutely dominating on Super Tuesday. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. This is a big one. If this was an amazing night, an amazing day, we have a great Republican Party with tremendous talent. And we want to have unity, and we're going to have unity. And we have no choice because November 5th, it's right around the corner, November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. Here's the latest this morning. Nikki Haley expected to exit the race for the GOP nomination after a dominating performance once again from the former president. The Wall Street Journal first to report the news. Bloomberg reporting Haley will make remarks from Charleston, South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Greg Valliere of AGF Investments joins us right now. Greg, that news dropping just moments ago. Hardly a surprise. Your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I, I thought it was going to come this week, so it is not not a big surprise, John. I, I think the big story now is, well, we want to see if she endorses Trump or not. I think she won't, or it'll be very tepid. The other big story, though, is the State of the Union address on Thursday night. Uh, I think Joe Biden really needs to hit the ball out of the park. If he stumbles, uh, if he gets his words wrong, it would be disastrous. This is his big chance to uh, be in front of the uh, a huge audience, and he needs to show that he still is uh, viable as a candidate. Trump began February with $30 million on hand, the Biden campaign north of $130 million. Yeah. With Nikki Haley dropping out, do her donors flock to the former president? They could, uh, Anne-Marie. I, I think there are two big factors that Trump has to worry about. One is money. Uh, is he going to raid the uh, Republican uh, coffers uh, for his legal fees? The other is abortion. Uh, I think it's been underemphasized. You look at what's happened in the last few months in states like Kansas, or Ohio. Uh, the public thinks the Republicans are too strident on abortion. And if they don't change their tune, that could be a real albatross for Trump. What we heard from Haley last night, she didn't come out and speak, but her campaign put out a statement saying that unity is not achieved by simply claiming it. This was a rebuttal to what the former president said at Mar-a-Lago. She has a point when it comes to when you look at the percentage of individuals who are still voting for her. In some states, it's 40 percent that she's getting the Republican primary yeah. vote. How does Trump close that gap in November? I would guess that a Trump emissary in the next few days will go to her and say, what do you want? Uh, what, what can we do? And I think issues like abortion, uh, a lot of issues for suburban moderates will be on the table. Uh, maybe a cabinet position, although I don't see her doing, doing that. I, I think that she will have a list of things that she wants. If she doesn't endorse uh, Donald Trump, how do you view his performance yesterday in terms of spinning forward to what his biggest challenge is going to be in the general? Well, he hasn't really defined much, has he? I mean, I, I'm not sure what his position is on the, the Middle East, on uh, Israel and Gaza. He hasn't said anything. So that's another opportunity for 
Biden, who frankly I think is actually a little underrated right now. I, I think it, it, Biden could go right to Trump and say, what is your prescription on Obamacare? He wants to kill Obamacare. What do you want to replace it with? There are all of these things that tr Trump has just talked about generally. He's going to have to get pinned down at some point. Terry Haynes came out and sort of his, some of his thoughts from yesterday and said, honestly, it's not just that it's going to be a rerun of what we've seen before. We've known that. What it is is that we're going to see probably a split Congress, and what we're probably going to get is no fiscal rightsizing, no 2017 uh, tax law permanence, no relief from overweening performative regulators. Do you agree that this is essentially the takeaway at a time where people are increasingly talking about all of these issues and whether we could see a shift at the White House? Well, that's possible, and I think the markets, as we all know, like gridlock from time to time. So I don't, I don't totally rule that out. But an awful lot depends on the Senate, and we saw still another change last night with Kirsten Sinema announcing she's not going to seek re-election. And I'm not positive that the Senate will be totally inept. They might get some things done. I don't rule out the Republicans taking over the Senate. Hey, Greg, wonderful to hear your thoughts. Uh, Greg Vallier there of HF Investments waiting for that address from Nikki Haley a little bit later this morning in Charleston, South Carolina. Liz Ann Sanders of Charles Schwab with us. Bramo, you know how this works. Oh, I apologise to our guests because we're about to talk about politics. But I'm going to talk about markets. We had double-digit losses year to date on Tesla, double-digit losses year to date on Apple. A piece of that puzzle is China, and a piece of that China puzzle is potentially rising nationalism in the mainland. How complicated is life going to become for multinationals, given what may happen later this year? Well, and it's not just um, Tesla and uh, Apple, but uh, Alphabet has been dragged down. It's, you know, the, two days ago I looked through a closing basis, and all three of those were ranked in the bottom quintile of uh, year-to-day performance in terms of the S&P 500. So I think it really does depend. And it's not just a, you know, are you a domestic company versus a multinational company. It's very much that tie to China. Um, either from a sourcing perspective or from a customer perspective. And, I, you know, you guys know I don't cover individual stocks, but I think that's one of the reasons for the speed with which companies are shifting their attention, uh, especially to places like India. We also had ADM come out and basically say the chip that they produce to basically get around the export controls actually will not get the license to go to China. Whether or not it is Biden or Trump, I'll come back to politics. <sighs> Do you think... The direction of travel is the same when it comes to Beijing and Washington? Well, in, in you, you, the, the rhetoric coming out of, of Trump and the campaign has been even more uh, aggressiveness on, on tariffs. And I, I think that that further divides the world into the uh, you know, multipolar structure that seems to be underway anyway as it relates to other things, uh, including the, the wars going on and to some degree, the de-dollarization, not de-dollarization broadly, but some of the de-dollarization of oil and the fact that oil is being transacted in currencies other than the dollar. And I think that that um, just adds to that story of, uh, of a very different world order. What do you think Trump trade volume two is? How different is it? Is it small caps, long small caps because well, of the fate of multinationals, he, he the says, difficulties you know, elsewhere? 60 percent tariffs uh, across the board. Um, I, I think that's obviously to the detriment of smaller companies that don't have the ability to be as nimble and shift, whether it's sourcing or manufacturing. I mean, a lot of that has been underway anyway. Um, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't generalize and just say small caps. Uh, to, to use my fine-tooth comb uh, uh, analogy again, I think yeah. looking at individual stocks these days, you, you've got to have that fine-tooth comb to, to see. Lisa wants to know if it's short treasuries, basically. Let's trust moment well, in the I, treasury market. Well, this is essentially the question, right? Can the U.S. face that because it's the reserve currency to the world? And so when you talk about de-dollarization, does that give enough of kind oil. of pressure? Right, but then there, you you say of yeah. oil, so then we're not looking at a head of lettuce <laughs> no, and seeing whether right. it's going to, yeah. yeah. Okay. Lisa, this was great. It's awesome <laughs> to see you. I can't believe it's, it's been so long. you guys too. Sabatra Jaffa came in the studio from SogGen a couple of months ago, and she said, I haven't seen you for four years. And I was like, I've seen you every month exactly. for the last four. Right. It just feels so odd. Listen, yes. it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next on this program, we'll talk China. Leela Miller of China Beige Book, as China looks to defend lofty goals for growth. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P 500. They are positive. We're positive a third of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
The day really picks up a little bit later this morning. Chairman Powell, volume one, onto volume two, onto tomorrow. Equity futures going into it. The scores look like this. Equities up 0.4% on the S&P, up 07 on the Nasdaq. That is a bounce back after two days of losses on the S&P. The biggest one-day slide going back to the middle of last month on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, the biggest one-day drop since the end of January. Tesla hitting discretionary. Apple hitting tech. China coming out with a growth target that hardly anyone believed in. In the bond market, yields were already a little bit lower. Lower again after we got the ISM. And I think the ISM is the real news yesterday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. The ISM did not confirm the January boom. Yields lower across the curve, Lisa. 4.56.40 this morning on a two-year. And yes, it was the headline disappointing. But more than that, it was the employment component, as you mentioned before, going into contractionary territory. And the prices paid component actually coming in less hot than expected. So it's basically the two-pronged approach. Maybe there's weakness under the hood. And oh, yeah, maybe the inflation pop that we saw in the previous CPI and PPI was kind of a blip. That's the bond market. Let's just turn to FX and... A little sprinkle of commodities too. Had a few people reach out to me yesterday saying, why aren't you talking about gold? Are you secretly buying some? So the answer is no. <laughs> but gold is at an all-time high and printed another all-time high, Lisa, a little bit earlier in the session. And this really goes to this question of what is the implication for monetary policy, right? Is there this idea that they're going to be cutting rates and then you could get some more value in non-interest bearing commodities? Is that some of the idea here? Or is it that inflation is going to pick back up because, frankly, the Fed is going to uh, cut rates more aggressively than perhaps the market is suggesting? I don't know. Take your pick. Maybe it's because it's a Bitcoin alternative. That's gold. <laughs> I want to finish on sterling 127.21. That currency pair is positive by 0.1%. So that's a slightly stronger pound right now against the US dollar. Later on this morning, 7.15 Eastern time, if you are in the United Kingdom, we're going to hand over programming from here in New York. We'll hand it over to London. The brilliant Francine Lacroix is going to give you a budget program at 7.15 Eastern time. Everyone outside of the UK is stuck with us. We're going to talk about everything else, including the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Under surveillance this morning, investors are waiting day one of Chair Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill. Powell begins in front of the House, where markets are expecting a less dovish message ahead of the Fed meeting later this month. The ADP employment data coming at 8.15 Eastern time, ahead of Powell's testimony at 10 o'clock. Then Chair Powell heads to the Senate tomorrow before the U.S. payrolls report on Friday. We touched on this briefly, Lisa. Will that data confirm the boom or not? And will it give the chairman, this Federal Reserve, a little bit more space to breathe? I like that you point straight to the data and you don't talk about what Jay Powell is going to actually say because that's how de-emphasized he feels right now to pretty much everyone who says he's going to come out, try to just say words, not really say much of anything, and then we're going to all look to the data. That ultimately is going to be the question, though. Do we see the weakness that the ISM data uh, seem to suggest? transpire or do we see another 300 some print and oh yeah what about the revisions no yeah what about hours worked are people working more hours which means that essentially all those fears that companies are cutting back little bits around the edges not to not to have to lay people off is kind of i don't know fiction and it's got to face down some democrats in that room tomorrow who have written him a letter writing a letter saying we want rate cuts and we want them yesterday and they've been talking about this, Jonathan, since January they wanted rate cuts. And they're talking about housing costs and how this is weighing on the everyday American consumer and how the Fed is behind because they should be cutting. You know, I look at what uh, Patrick McHenry, the Republican North Carolina chair of the House Financial Services, he said the biggest thing before the Fed is not a quarter point this way or that way, but this larger view of capital for bigger banks. So the Democrats are going to hone in on housing costs and what's hitting uh, everyday Americans with these rate hikes. And then Republicans are going to go to capital rules on the big banks. We pretty much know what the politicians are going to say. And I think for Jay Powell, it's, he's just going to try to not make news. Hey, prepare for the politics. We're going to be talking about shrinkflation, <laughs> corporate price gouging, corporate greed, yeah. all of those things. I mean, is that what coming does up? he say? Is he going to say, can I give you a lesson on inflation the way that I see it? You know, actually, give me the next half hour. Roll out some sort of PowerPoint. I would say, love that. You know, it would be, you know, just really, let me explain to you how monetary policy works. People, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we'll get that. Shrinkflation is going to be one of the big topics, not so much today or tomorrow, but, oh, well, tomorrow, but tomorrow evening, Thursday evening. Biden, I think, is really going to hone in. He did it yesterday when he was talking about credit card fees. He's going to hone in on this is the problem for big companies. They're price gouging, they're shrinkflation. Yes, we know you're still feeling inflation, but it's not my fault. Wasn't he talking about the cookie monster as well? Did you see that too? I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Let's, move Let's on. talk about the BOJ. Japan's biggest bank is preparing for the BOJ to hike rates and exit negative territory on March 19th. The call from MUFG coming as markets 
are still pricing in about a 50% chance of a hike. The bank's head of global markets making the bet and expecting the bank to hike yet again by October at the latest. The compare and contrast is always striking, Bramo. We're talking about cuts in America. We're still waiting for the first hike from the BOJ. Yeah, so that they can get all the way up to 0.25% uh, by October. That's the goal, and that's what some people are saying. In order to do that, you've got to start now because it's really going to be a tough slog to get there. So that's essentially the argument here. They're in a world of their own. What I think has been taken off the table is the tail risk that they're going to do this somehow rapidly because that doesn't happen over with the Bank of Japan. And either way, it doesn't seem like markets are expecting or girding for any kind of extreme action. I know you know markets. this, but let's snark. This is a multi-decade effort. I know you know this, but I do think this is an important moment for Japanese authorities. I think it's an incredibly important moment, and I think it explains why people have the confidence to go into Japanese equities. I think it's important to frame just how ludicrous it is that we're talking about raising rates from negative to not negative, right? This is what we're talking about. But taking a step back, this is an emo amazing and pivotal moment that I think a lot of people are recognizing with new dynamism in a country that was left behind and really uh, had a lot of forgotten decades. I mean, I'm with you, and I'm the worst for snark anyway, so we'll park that there. <laughs> you know, I know. China <laughs> pushing back on doubt amid skepticism. The country saying its 5% growth target is attainable through, quote, vigorous effort. That's according to a top Chinese official speaking on the sidelines of the National People's Congress. China based book CEO Lena Miller calling the number useless, saying this 5% is a completely useless number for markets to toil with, largely because hitting it is almost totally incompatible with what else they're promising to do, all of which pushes against the notion that they will prioritize much stronger growth. The government's GDP growth target of 5% makes us dumber on China, not more informed. Leland, I'm pleased to say it's with us right now. Leland, let's get straight to it. I think the, the obvious question, and the one you can help us with, I hope, what is the purpose of a GDP target in Xi's China? There used to be a purpose, which was setting a goal for output, and then the government would, you know, juice the economy. It would, it would uh, grow the economy, then juice the economy to hit that target. Uh, the GDP target no longer has a real, uh, a real purpose anymore. It's just a relic that they are having a hard time getting away from. I think the reality behind the scenes is that they are envisioning a world, as you know, we've been talking about for the past ten years uh, on, on your show. That is going to go from you know six to five to four to three to probably to two and one, very low levels of growth. They can't articulate this. They don't know what to do with that. That doesn't mean they're going to change their economic plans. They are gearing for a slower, hopefully healthier economy going forward, but they don't know how to articulate that and they don't know what the signal is to send to foreign to foreign investors. So they put out this ridiculous number that is totally incompatible with everything else they're saying, and they say, just here it is. Make of this what you want. We don't really care anymore. Leland, some people are saying that it indicates some sort of panic or some sort of desperation or some sort of frustration on the part of uh, the People's Congress of China. Do you agree with those types of assessments? No, I think it's the exact opposite. I think the major problem that foreign analysts are having right now is that they misunderstand it. They, they see what's going on. They're like, oh, she must be panicking. He must be approaching his pain threshold. Why doesn't he do more? The lesson here is, is they don't think things are all that bad. Yes, the economy didn't recover great last year. Yes, growth is, is, is no longer going to be anywhere near the, uh, you know, the old targets. Yes, they're not going to use the old stimulus playbook. They don't want to. Their focus is elsewhere. So the, the, real, the real problem that, that markets have to get around to on China is understanding that we're in a new paradigm. The leadership's economic priorities are completely different, and they are not all that disappointed with, with the level of growth right now and with the level of economic activity. They want to avoid a doom loop of confidence. They don't want the bottom to fall out, but they're not concerned about the levels of growth. Which raises a question of how much they actually want international involvement in their economy. We talked about yesterday Apple and Tesla and some of the disappointing deliveries during the beginning of the year, and we were wondering, is this because of domestic pushes to buy more domestic <laughs> rather than and in the U.S., or is this just real weakness among a consumer base that's really faced a lot of struggles in China? Well, probably both, but a lot of it is the former. Uh, you know, th this is this is yet more policy incoherence. They don't ha they have a message that they're welcoming foreign investment, but at the same time they're cracking down on foreign firms. They're they're very explicitly saying we need to rely less on on foreign supply chains on and on foreign inputs. So let's build more ourselves domestically. So it's it, it's just an incoherence in the message. And I think you combine that with a weak economy, and everyone's scratching their head. You know what's happening? What's happening? But if you listen to what they've been saying for several years.
years now, it's very clear what's going on. Yes, you have a weak economy, but they're also trying to be more to be less reliant on U.S. goods, and they're trying to minimize, uh, you know, the the impact of Apple and others uh, in their economy. You say the biggest mistake China watchers make is that she is panicking. You say this is not at all what it is. But if she was to be panicking, what would we see then? I think at some point you have a situation where the economy falls apart and you know you 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 expect bigger stimulus. You know, if you look at what happened in the stock market, they got to the point where they don't really care what happens in the stock market, but they also don't want the fall, stock market to fall so precipitously that it creates this doom loop and it affects in a big way the wider economy, which is which is normally uncorrelated with with the stock market. So I think they'll step in in order to set a floor. Uh, if they ever thought they were they went into real panic and they thought things were a true mess and they had a real capital outflow crisis, then I think you'd see more louder. Hard-hitting support, uh, but you know we're nowhere near there right now. I think that's the important takeaway. Leonard, I just want to probe a few pieces of some of the things you've said. You've talked about them being comfortable with the current growth trajectory. Yet at the same time, in the last year, they suspended reporting youth unemployment. You talk about that comfort with the equity market. At the same time, going into the big holiday over in China, they were banning net selling at the start of the session and at the end of the session. Is that incompatible with your views? No, it just shows there's more incoherence. I mean, net selling is banned not just in China, but anywhere when markets get panicky. And so this was one of the times the market kept falling and falling. They brought the national team in for the stock market. It kept falling. They said, OK, we got to do a little bit more because if it's the bottom falls out, then we've got a real problem and people may think the economy is falling apart. So they stepped in with bigger measures to boost confidence in the stock market. But I think, again, the, 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 the rule of the day is they want to do just enough to keep things going. They're not trying to juice things. They don't care about investor returns. They're, they don't want to return to, to high levels of growth or even medium levels of growth. They want to continue to restructure the economy, minimize e external reliance, build up a domestic chip ecosystem, focus on national security priorities. All these things that are really important to Xi now, they're not worried about the old priorities, and they're just trying to muddle through as best they can without having the, the floor fall out. And that's the level of support we're going to see going forward. What you're saying paints a pretty bleak picture, in my view, for certainly an international investor. No big stimulus coming, no real emphasis on growth, and not a clear message in terms of what they really want with international investors. So from a U.S. perspective, is China uninvestable? No, you know, we get this all the time. I don't think it's uninvestable per se, but I think that the old days of investing in the stock market, investing, closing your eyes and just sort of checking back every quarter as you cashed out your dividends on the big tech giants, those days are obviously over. If you have a line of business that can operate in China, it is compatible with the government's uh, goals and they need your expertise or they, they you know, they, they need your, your company, then, then you could do okay in China, fine, going forward. There's a lot of companies that still do. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the lure of China was this idea that there's you know a billion plus consumers and that if you sell anything in China, you're going to make a lot of money. That was never true. It was always sold as sort of a marketing theme. And now it's, it's, it's clearly blown apart, that, that entire thesis. So you got to be very, very careful if you're investing in China right now. So well said. Leland, you're one of the absolute best at this, and we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, sir. Leland Miller of the China Beige Book. Speaking of a trade, we're up by more than 12% from the lows of early February on a CSI 300. If I was in that trade and I was listening to that, I feel a little bit more uncomfortable after that conversation. Because a trade means you've got to be, have an eye on the exit. And what he's just saying is, if there's no bazooka coming, what's the next, cat next catalyst for some sort of upside swing? Stocks here stateside doing OK. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Goldman Sachs is zeroing in on the Middle East, Europe and Africa as it builds out its private banking operations for the world's wealthy. A senior executive at Goldman says the bank recently hired at least six private wealth advisors in the region from rivals including J.P. Morgan Chase, Credit Suisse, and Rothschild and Company. Goldman Sachs plans to keep looking outside the company for more advisors. Nordstrom lower in the pre-market by about 10%, forecasting muted revenue and comparable sales growth at its high-end stores. Nordstrom sees revenue for the fiscal year between negative 1% to 2%. And it's planning for their investment in its digital strategy and its discount rack stores, which has an improving outlook that outpaced expectations. 
Senator Bob Menendez has been indicted again in connection with an ongoing bribery case. Federal prosecutors added obstruction of justice charges to existing criminal counts against Menendez and his wife. Many Democrats have called on the New Jersey senator to step down after he was initially indicted last September. Meanwhile, independent Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema has announced she won't run for a second term. Her decision ends the possibility of a turbulent race in one of the nation's most politically competitive states. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. Big market day. Every day I've done a, every single time I've done a market check so far this morning, Lisa's been laughing at me every time I've said biggest one day loss since middle of February because we're down only 1%. <laughs> Here's the stat from Allegra Catelli here at Bloomberg. We've not had a 2% drop or more in a single day since February 2023, the longest run without such a pullback in six years. Yesterday, when I was looking at the returns after the close, I thought to myself, is this a dip? Because it's going to be viable. Does it count as a dip? And what we're learning this morning is, yep, it is. That's why 1% pullback is drama. Bramo these days. Ah, such That's drama. drama. Love it. S stocks are better today, up a third of 1%. Up next on the program, Chair Powell on Capitol Hill. If they cut, there's going to be complaints, and if they don't cut, there's going to be complaints. If they don't go by June, it's going to be a lot harder for them to start cutting. That conversation up next, live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City. We won't go there. I'm not even going to tell you what Carl's talking about. We'll get to Carl in a moment, though, on the Fed chair. I got the finger. On Fed chair, Jay Powell. The floor finger. Oh. Not who he thinks might be the Fed chair in the future. Equity futures right now on the S&P, positive by a third of 1%. It's not Bramo or me or Anne-Marie or TK, for that matter. Yield tire by a single basis point on a 10-year, 416. Under surveillance this morning, Chair Powell on Capitol Hill. So there definitely is a political, I think, a, a part of this, and it, that's one of the reasons why Jay Powell sort of, I think, laid the groundwork for cuts way back in December. But as you know, if they cut, there's going to be complaints, and if they don't cut, there's going to be complaints. If they don't go by June, it's going to be a lot harder for them to start cutting. It's the latest this morning. Fed Chair Jay Powell facing Congress for round one on Capitol Hill. This ahead of Friday's jobs report. Carl Riccadonna of BNP Paribas expecting payrolls to rise by 220,000 due to, quote, an underlying acceleration and broadening out of job growth in the more cyclical sectors. The median estimate in our survey here at Bloomberg calling for a print of 200K. Carl, I'm pleased to say it's with us around the table in New York. Carl, good morning to you. Good morning. Let's start with power, then we get to payrolls, because sure. I find that cyclical broadening out fascinating. Sure. What are you expecting to hear from him with that in mind? Well, we have to remember when Powell is testifying on Capitol Hill at these semi-annual events, uh, he's speaking on behalf of the broader committee, so it's not his opinion that uh, necessarily he could uh, express in the press conference. Uh, it is him testifying on behalf of the, the, the broader committee. And I think that, uh, you know, we've been in an exceptional period recently where everyone is singing out of the ha same uh, hymnal at the Fed. Uh, the Waller speech, what's the rush, I think is the best summary of kind of what uh, what the Fed is thinking. And uh, everyone is saying there's no hurry to start moving, but it does seem appropriate uh, to start moving sometime relatively soon. Maybe not with an aggressive cutting campaign. Uh, this is not the, the economy rolling into recession, but uh, a more gradual recalibration of policy. If I could just put one point around that. Of course. Right? Last week we saw the PCE deflator data. Headline PCE deflator, which is the Fed's target, has gone from above seven to now rounding to two. So we're not at two. We can't say mission accomplished, but we are getting much closer to target, which means that the monetary policy prescription that was in place at seven is not appropriate uh, when you're basically rounding towards your target. And so a recalibration is appropriate at some point. I'm itching soon. to get to payrolls. You know that. So let's talk sure. about it. End of last year. This is how people talked about the jobs market in America. Payroll growth was okay, but it was coming from fewer and fewer industries. We were Absolutely. talking about narrowing breadth. Now you're talking about the broadening of job growth in the more cyclical sectors. Where is that change coming from? So the change is coming from a very interesting point, which is the collective improvement of animal spirits in the economy. So this is, you know, we, we try to put a price tag on fiscal stimulus or Fed action or whatnot. If collectively we step back from where we are, let's say, Thanksgiving weekend of last year, where, uh, you know, 10-year treasuries were flirting with 5%, stocks have a negative tone, uh, and people are still very much in the recession camp and concerned about consumers, student loan payments, et cetera. If we step back from that and everyone says, 
wait a minute, maybe recession risks are materially lower and we're too conservative in our expectations and plans for CapEx spending, business fixed investment, and also headcount for 2024, all of, all of a sudden that collective improvement in mood can have a very powerful consequence. And we can see that in those more cyclical sectors uh, going from net job loss in October, a little positive in November, more positive in December, much better in January. There seems to be an improvement in CEO, CFO, hiring manager sentiment, uh, which is contributing to this kind of uh, cyclical uh, reacceleration in the pace of job uh, growth and also improving uh, forecast for economic growth in uh, 2024. I can hear the voices in my head, not all of them, but <laughs> some of the ones, the ones that are saying. We are live, Bram. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that are saying. Let's, let's, but, let's break this down. Not, what are they telling you? The ones that are saying. Dr. Carl but, wants but, a chat. But what about uh, hours work? I'm just going to keep going. Hours worked uh, going down because people don't want to get rid of labor and they want to keep it in play. Mm. What about what we got from ISM service? yesterday, doesn't that indicate some sort of softening? ISM services are still in expansionary territory, so it tells you things are okay. I think if we look at the manufacturing ISM, uh, more broadly, not focusing on one single month, we can see that uh, there's a bit of an inventory cycle starting to improve and broader uh, kind of demand improvement in the economy, where I think the manufacturing sector will look better in 2024 than it did in 2023. Uh, and so you see some sense of improving momentum. You can even see it in kind of the tracking forecast for uh, economic growth that the you know, consensus forecasts are tracking uh, to a, a faster pace of growth. Not to say the economy is going to grow faster this year relative to uh, uh, last year, but there is there are elements of this uh, improvement. We've buried the lead. You've changed your view. You came out overnight. You came out in your latest report, basically saying you pushed back your expectations for the first rate cut. Da 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 da. Drum roll. It's June from uh -huh. May, and that you actually think that the Fed's going to cut less this year. Now, 100 basis points versus 150 basis points prior. Right. How big of a shift is this? Does this matter from an economic perspective in terms of a steeper drop off later on? Or is this basically just the new normal? This is a very different kind of economic cycle where it looks like recession risks have faded. Now, you can never say it's zero. Uh, there's always some element of some unknown event uh, that, that could disrupt the economy. And so there has to be some kind of lower level of uh, recession assessment. But going from uh, six to four cuts, I think, is, uh, you know, more of the kind of Fed's uh, uh, reaction function to what we're seeing in the data. Uh, you mentioned the hours work being down. Uh, I think there was a big disruption in January, which I hate to be the economist playing weatherman, but in January and February, you get to put that hat on occasionally. I'm playing the we can see that there were weather disruptions in the labor data in January. And so I think hours worked, the length of the work week, um, those sorts of things will spring back uh, when we see the, uh, uh, the, the Friday jobs number. Uh, but this is a very different Fed cycle because it's a recalibration of policy. So if we're looking for a parallel, 94 with Alan Greenspan is kind of the best example where, OK, inflation's coming down. There's some sort of uh, productivity improvement happening in the economy. We don't know in real time the full extent of that, but we can see that it's improving. Uh, there seems to be a labor supply shock that uh, really boosted the economy last year in the back half. Uh, and probably is carrying over to some degree uh, into the first part of this year. And so the Fed has the luxury of moving slowly. But nonetheless, as I highlighted to John, yep. the inflation numbers have improved materially. So you can start recalibrating policy to ensure that you have a soft landing for the economy. 30 seconds left, so super tight if you can. It's a challenge for you, I know, Carl. Let's finish on this. There was a comment from Chairman Powell at the end of January when he said, we don't look at strong growth as a problem. That predated a jobs report. Is he still saying that now? I think he is still saying that because there's evidence of this labor supply shock. There's some sort of supply shock in the economy. And when we start pulling back the layers of the onion, it seems to be a labor supply shock. And so if you're, ha you know, he is a product of the 1980s. The 1980s was, uh, you know, supply side economics. And uh, because of these dynamics, right, where you had very strong growth in the back half of, the, uh, of last year, but you had inflation coming down. Um, that's the, the fingerprints of a supply shock. And so in that type of environment, you can maybe not ignore, but dial back your concern about above trend growth yep. uh, and just focus on inflation doing what it needs to do, which January aside, it has been doing that. That was about 30. Carl, it's good to see you. Great there to you catch go. up, buddy. Great to catch up as always. Carl Recadona there of BNP Paribas looking ahead to Fed Chair Jay Powell, Volume 1. You okay, Bramo? I'm great. What are they saying to you? Uh, they're saying, 
Sell stocks. <laughs> short <laughs> yeah, credit. Let's care. trust in the treasury market. Lettuce. Something like that. Eric Friedman of US Bank Asset Management up next. Bloomberg's Michael Shepard joining us too. Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management. All of that in the next hour. If there's a concern about equities, it's just that they have gone much further ahead. Equity markets will reshape to accommodate the demands of increased participation. I think there's enough positive catalysts to potentially keep the market going. The economic excitement that's coming out, I think, is another reason to get excited about stocks now. It's really the earnings that we expect to do the heavy lifting. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm not sure what's happening. Nouria Rabini is constructive. Lisa's hearing bullish voices. It's all going down from New York City this morning. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market's doing OK, up a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Following yesterday's losses, it's all about Chairman Powell in front of the House a little bit later on this morning. Then, Lisa, on to the Senate tomorrow. And will he be able to say anything at all that's new? Because we've heard from a lot of the Fed members repeatedly. And so there's really a question of, is it really going to be about him? You asked a question earlier this morning, and I thought it was a fascinating one. Are we seeing monetary policy and the Federal Reserve seriously de-emphasized in a market that's moving on and not necessarily seeing risk appetite tied so closely to Fed policy? Purely from an observational point of view, from my perspective, just look at the price action so far this year. We've priced out so many cuts. We've pushed back the timing, reduced the magnitude. Equity markets still ripped, still ripped, still rallied, and still done okay, even when the likes of Apple has been terrible. The likes of Tesla has been even worse. And Google, we know their struggles. They continue to struggle. The why of this is fascinating to me, because so many guests have come on and not given the same answer to the why, which is the reason why I hear voices. But it's also the reason why I thought that Jim Caron at Morgan Stanley was so interesting when he came out yesterday and said fiscal policy is more important than monetary policy right now. And that fiscal policy is a, the driver of a lot of the reason why people have spending cash, of why companies are still chugging along and will be supportive going into the election. That, I think, is an increasing tone that I'm hearing during a week of an incredible amount of economic but also political news. So you'll get the view on the economy from Chairman Powell a little bit later this morning. Then tomorrow evening at about 8 p.m. Eastern time, you'll hear from the President of the United States in the State of the Union address. And now, if you didn't know before, he now knows for sure. He's going to be facing off Donald Trump because all of the reports from the media organization stateside this morning, AMA suggesting Nikki Haley is heading to that exit. Yep, she's out. And at 10 a.m., she's going to announce it herself in her home state. I mean, it was a long shot bid anyway, given the fact that she was running against basically a quasi incumbent. The next question, of course, if we were just constantly asking when is she going to drop out, the next question is, is she going to endorse the former president? The former president wants to get a handle on some of those donors that's been backing her, because this is where he has a huge disadvantage to President Joe Biden. Yeah, you're on top of it. It's money. Fundraising. Biden's absolutely dominated the fundraising. Nikki Haley's been attracting a lot of financial support over the last few months. I think it begs the question. She heads to the exit. Does he get the money now, or does that money stay on the sidelines? It's a great question, because when you saw some big donors, some fiscal conservatives, individuals who say we are never Trump, but we are staunchly conservatives, back out. They say they still want Nikki Haley to succeed, but they're not going to push their money there. So they're putting their money down the ballot. I think a lot of it depends who Trump picks as his VP. Can any of these big donors get behind a vice presidential candidate they like? But just to remind you of these numbers, Trump began February $30 million. Biden, $130 million. It is a massive war chest that this campaign is going to be put to use in seven key swing states. We're going to be parsing through all of the details of this for the next however many months, which I'm sure everyone's super excited about. But what I find fascinating is what Terry Haynes said in terms of the takeaways from yesterday, which is that you're basically you're probably going to get a split Congress and you're going to get no fiscal right sizing, no 2017 tax law permanence, and no relief from what he calls overweighting performative regulators. What does this mean in terms of what we get with mergers and acquisitions, what we get for a potential premium in the debt markets, and for uh, potential uh, tax overhangs that people are looking for. Honestly, that is what I'm focused on at a time where we're trying to shift to, OK, well, what's the trade here? You're only focused on the second point. I know you are. And you've been talking about it, and you're right to. And we're going to continue talking about it, by the way. The prospect of having a repeat of what happened in the UK, that you have a leader that comes into power that has some lofty goals about producing economic growth at a time when maybe we don't need it. Well, and if you can't get tax law permanence to that point, you can't have that offset 
to some of the proposals with respect to tariffs, with respect to some of the spending, that's the rub. And that's where you start to get maybe a question of a bond market rebelling. But everyone's been writing in to tell me that I'm ridiculous with Liz Trust because it's completely different. And the U.S. is the reserve currency to the world. And I understand and recognize that. Thank you. They have the privilege of behaving recklessly for now. But that can always change. Bramma, we'll keep asking, okay? Just Thank for you. you. Thank you. Equities right now on the S&P, positive a third of 1%. A massive day ahead stateside for financial markets worldwide. It starts with Chairman Powell later on this morning, carries on tomorrow, then goes into payrolls on Friday. Stocks are doing okay. Yields are a little bit higher uh, by almost a basis point, 4.15.84 on a US 10-year. Coming up this hour, Eric Friedman of US Bank Asset Management with big tech pulling stocks lower. Bloomberg's Michael Shepard as Nikki Haley exits the GOP race. And Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan with Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony a few hours away. We begin with our top story, a trio of tech heavyweights hitting turbulence and raising big questions about tech valuations. Eric Friedman of US Bank Asset Management writing this, we do not view domestic dynamics as bubbly. We see this as constrained supply meeting more stage demand. As prospective AI buyers evaluate applications for their businesses, we continue to let winners run and favor domestic equities over international. Eric's with us around a table in New York. Eric, good to see you. Great to be here, John. Before we get to domestic versus international, I want to talk about letting winners run. What winners? Which ones? The ones from last year or the ones that continue to run this year? Yeah, I think the ones from last year. And, and so far, if you look at the broadening out, it's been more muted in terms of that broadening out effect. But certainly we are seeing more than just tech and consumer discretionary work well. So that's, a, that's certainly a positive. But our viewpoint is that the AI phase is not really a, let's, let's call it a, a bubblicious environment. Again, maybe it's tainted somewhat from uh, my time in San Francisco during the 99-2000 uh, run-up. But this is a matter of, of companies wanting to get involved, but just not really having the access that they need. So again, we think that tech is still a momentum play, but one that we would still be involved with. Others agree with you. Bank of America say there's a little sign of euphoria. I think Goldman Sachs said tech valuations were backed by fundamentals. But within the MAG7, we've seen it break down. We saw two of them yesterday really struggle, the likes of Tesla, the likes of Apple as well. What do you make of that leadership shift within the MAG7 itself? Yeah, I think it's important to gauge. And I think if that, if anything, it's positive, there is some differentiation. And in terms of what we're really gauging, if you will, on the Ford view is what happens with AI spend. So cyber and AI spend are things that we track pretty significantly in terms of our, our bottoms up research and it's still there. There's obviously a backlog. You're seeing a increased uh, uh, you know, flare out, if you will, of other chip companies getting involved. And so that for us is a positive. So I think if you start to see again, that sort of you know lights on, lights off, everything is up, everything is down at the same time, that would be more, more negative. The fact that there is some more differentiation is, is at least from our perspective, a, a mild positive. Is the differentiation with respect to artificial intelligence revenue streams, or is it largely due to China and just how much exposure some of these companies have? Yeah, I think it's, it's key, at least if you look at, at the Chinese story in particular right now, if you look at, at the data that we're actually getting, it's actually more muted, not just the, the fundamentals, but also the breadth of data you get. So looking at individual companies, that's become a much more important part of our data process. Less either private surveys or even you know, official Chinese surveys. So that, that feed through has been important and certainly there's a slowdown. We do think that China runs the risk of, of throwing the old playbook at the, at the problem. We've been underweight, which has been beneficial for the last you know, couple of months, but certainly the last six weeks, it's been a, a bit more challenging, so. Is there a message in this that you can spin forward? Uh, John's been talking about multinationals and how in general there's sort of a struggle, especially if you count on international revenues from the likes of China. Are you playing that theme through other sectors other than just the big tech behemoths? Yeah, we are. I think if you look at, at a couple of, of subsectors where it's, it's been really important, one has been global retail. And if you look at some of the, the value add, if you will, from even the European retailers and also some of the, the larger domestic ones, we of course have had a lot of earnings in the last couple of weeks and we have more to follow. But I think that the, the read through, if you will, is that the consumer is now looking for value. And that to us is maybe some indication that there's a differentiation across middle income as well as lower income consumers. So the fact you're starting to see maybe those aspirational buyers step back a bit, not just get into you know, brands that they, they want to get into persistently, but also brands that you know, maybe they're priced out of, that suggests there's maybe a little bit of a slowdown for lower income consumers, which could be a bit of a tell for our macro view. When it comes to China, there's been a lot of talk as these are trades, not investments. Is there anything that China could do that would change your mind on being underweight? 
Yeah, and Marie, I think it's something where, structurally speaking, the property market holds the key. And that is such a structural issue for them that, that uh, you know, that's, that's tough to overcome. I do think the export push is something that we can't discount as being immaterial. So one would be a massive export push. The other would be perhaps a bit more mobility by Chinese consumers. Again, passport penetration in China is something like 5 or 6%. It's tiny. And, and the fact that there is more of that push for experiences versus stuff that could lead to maybe some positive outgrowth from China, but we're really not seeing that materialize quite yet. Lisa raised this question. Let's talk about fixed income and the repricing of Fed rate cuts. How have we done this with the equity market still close to all time highs? What's your explanation for it? Yeah, it, it's been one where, if anything, the Fed has said, uh, market, you have to flinch because we're not going to. And, and that flinch process has been, in some cases, gradual. Uh, but in some cases, if you also look at the, the, the tone, I think Lisa's been all over this. If you look at the mix of the, of the auctions, which we're paying very close attention to, I know that your colleague Tom Keane is not as interested, but we're very interested. <laughs> and, and You're welcome you, back anytime. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, you know, we've seen something like 41, 42 percent of foreign participation drop down to 28. 29. And in some auctions, it's been south of 10, 11 percent. So that says to us that, you know, this bond repricing is happening really from a mix of more price indiscriminate buyers. Think about pension funds, banks and central banks. They tend not to be so price sensitive. But if you now look at who's buying bonds, these are asset managers like us that are very, very price sensitive. So in a way, you've had this, this shift, if you will, away from the almost indiscriminate buying and more into, you know what, uh, these, the, the, the fiscal house, if you will, is, is more important to foreign buyers and, and price discrimination is, is more, more key. Is the fiscal house already being priced in to the Treasury market or is this something where there could be a more significant kind of shock at one of these auctions that I do follow and care very much about? Yeah, I think it's probably second or third inning priced in, Lisa. I think if anything, there's so much noise happening with the Fed, you know, when does the Fed start cuts? Will they cut two times, three times, what have you? This is probably a late 2024, early 2025 story. Once we get past election, once we get past through some of this Fed noise, really paying attention to not just treasuries, but also the tips auctions, those we think are areas that could be more of a focus for, uh, for investors. So we're paying very close attention to it. Eric, true story. This is about timing and not content. Auctions are in the afternoon. <laughs> And TK naps in the afternoon. That's why Tom will always say he doesn't care about a couple of things, it's right? true. Auctions, yeah. Fed minutes. Yep. OK, if he wasn't on air, he wouldn't be watching the news 100%. concert with Chairman Powell. Correct. All of those things. Anything after midday, between midday and the close, <laughs> you know, he doesn't care about. I kind of get it, though. I mean, I'll just say, you know, I find my lull. But, you know, I still pay attention because it's that riveting. I'm, I'm tired, but I still care. It's gripping stuff. Eric, you're going to stick with us. Eric Friedman. Equity markets right now. Futures positive. Actually, almost session highs up by 0.4%. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Morgan Stanley has laid off about 9% of its asset management unit in China. That according to routers. The headcount reductions are said to have started in December and impact about 15 employees. China's economy has been facing multiple headwinds from an enduring real estate slump to geopolitical tensions, placing pressure on markets and its $3.8 trillion fund sector. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley set to end her campaign after a poor showing in a string of primary contests, setting up a rematch of the 2020 election in November. Haley is due to speak in her home state of South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern. Former President Donald Trump swept Super Tuesday, winning all races except Vermont. Acne products from brands including Proactive, Targets Up and Up, and Clinique have been found to contain high levels of a chemical linked to cancer. Independent testing lab Valisher has asked the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to issue a recall for affected treatments. All contain the active ingredient benzyl peroxide, which the lab says can break down and form benzene, a known carcinogen. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. Up next on the program, a Trump-Biden rematch, all but certain. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. This is a big one. If this was an amazing night, an amazing day. That conversation up next, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Equity markets near session highs on the S&P 500 up here by 0.4%. Yields going nowhere. Tenure, 4.15.64. Under surveillance this morning, a Trump-Biden rematch, all but certain.
They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. This is a big one. If this was an amazing night, an amazing day, we have a great Republican Party with tremendous talent, and we want to have unity, and we're going to have unity. And we have no choice because November 5th, it's right around the corner, November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. It's the latest this morning. Nikki Haley expected to exit the race for the GOP nomination after a dominating performance from the former president yesterday. Haley will speak from South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern time. The current president facing mounting divisions and a growing number of uncommitted voters on Super Tuesday just before a crucial State of the Union address tomorrow. Bloomberg's Michael Shepard joins us now from Washington. Shep, Nikki Haley, what next? Well, that's the question of the hour, really. Uh, we've confirmed that she will be pulling out of the race, but how she do it, does it and what message she sends as she makes this announcement to her supporters, to voters across the country, and also to donors will be very interesting to watch. Uh, we've confirmed that she is not expected to endorse Donald Trump, uh, her rival for the nomination, as she pulls out of the race, which is an interesting tell. We were seeing signals that she might hold off on an endorsement or withhold one altogether on Sunday uh, during remarks on some of the Sunday shows. She indicated a reluctance to do so. And that's no surprise in a way, because through this campaign, we've seen increased distance between Haley, who served under Trump as uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and the former president. They are just so different in so many ways. Trump is the iconoclast, and Haley has been, tried to, has been trying to run a much more establishment Republican-type campaign, one that's far less of the America first, far less of the isolationist, and one that is trying to uh, hew a little bit more closely to, as I said, the, the earlier brand of Republican politics. Shep, is there room in a Trump 2.0 administration for an establishment voice like Nikki Haley? I think there are some people in the Republican Party who would like to see room for someone like Haley and for others, for that matter. But it is hard to see. The, uh, the numbers show it in terms of delegates. When you look at Trump, he has 995 delegates to Haley's 89 to the convention coming up. Trump is almost at the point of clinching it. But there's more than that just in the raw numbers. That really signals just how much this has become Trump's Republican Party. And we even see people like Mitch McConnell, I mentioned before, he is stepping back from the Republican leadership in the Senate from that role, uh, in part because he is recognizing that uh, the tide of history is turning away from his brand of politics for now and much more toward Trump's on the Republican side. Yeah, Karl Rove has been talking about this on Fox News, and he was saying it last night, looking at the margins. Haley still, even though obviously it is Trump's party, Haley still picking up 20 percent in North Carolina, Virginia, almost 35 percent. How does Trump close that gap come November? Well, that is the big challenge. And Haley is going to uh, have to make clear to, to her voters that they have a choice. Uh, and Trump will have to do some work to reach out to them to persuade them to vote for him in November. Some of the voters that we talked to when we were out in Iowa and, uh, and in New Hampshire for some of the earliest nominating contests, the Haley supporters, a few of them indicated to us just randomly that, hey, if it came down to a Trump-Biden rematch, they might cross party lines and vote for Biden. Now, that's unscientific. You know, we would have to do a fresh survey to see how that would break down. But really, uh, the, the challenge for Trump is reaching out to people who opted for Haley because they didn't like his message and what he was uh, trying to sell to them. Let's talk about Joe Biden's campaign. He obviously swept last night, but Minnesota, about 20 percent came out and voted uncommitted, and they were less organized than, say, that group was in Michigan. What does he need to say on Thursday to shore up parts of his base? Well, uh, Joe Biden has a lot more to do uh, on Thursday night than just shore up parts of the base. It really is a broad message. He is trailing Trump right now in a head-to-head -head rematch. And in our own Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, we show the president trailing Trump 43% uh, to 48% among voters if it came down to uh, an election being held today between the two men. Uh, specifically to your question, what do Michigan and, and Minnesota last night say about uh, Biden's vulnerability? Specifically, that refers to the Mideast. And Biden is going to have to really 
read the needle on Gaza. He's under a lot of pressure from progressives in his party who are growing increasingly concerned over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. And his and they really want him to do more to ensure that there is a, 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 an an immediate, but also a lasting ceasefire for humanitarian reasons. And if he is unable to satisfy that, it risks turning voters away in November simply because they don't have confidence in him on this particular issue. And in a closely contested state like Michigan or even Minnesota, you could see the president really in a tight spot if he loses those voters. Hey, Shep, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Over in Washington, D.C., if you are just joining us, a dominating evening for the former president, Donald Trump. And Nikki Haley set to head to the exit, 10 a.m. Eastern time, speaking from her home state of South Carolina. We're expecting that announcement a little bit later this morning. Eric Friedman with us here in New York City. Eric, I want to talk about the Treasury market. It's what Lisa's talking about. It's what we touched on briefly already. We've got two candidates, and I'm not sure if either one wins, they're going to tackle the nation's debt. Are you sure? No, we don't think it's going to be politically popular for either party. It's probably like out two turns, Jonathan, before this gets addressed. Probably the most important factor we're paying attention to with the upcoming election is number one, trade policy, and then number two, what happens with the regulatory. And, and so trade policy, look, the sneaky risk in markets right now is that we do see a Treasury yield that just hangs around like your in-laws post-Thanksgiving. It just kind of remains elevated. Again, I love my in-laws. I shouldn't say bad things, but... Uh, good correction but, there. Yeah, well done, <laughs> uh, especially you know, close to good Mother's Day. Places, yeah, exactly. So um, so ultimately, the, the idea is that, look, this, this, this overall level of rates has acted like a, a ramp on a treadmill. And and this economy just can't stand Fed funds at 5.33% in perpetuity. So if we see a trade policy, which is more, let's call it shifts from isolationism to something even, even more significant, that trust would be inflationary in nature. And so the Fed, Treasury does not want to see that happen, I think, at a bigger scale, because we can't just keep funding, again, deficits at, at increasing, uh, increasing rates. People have been so hopeful that we're not going to get a Trump-Biden matchup, which is essentially what we're getting, that they haven't focused on policy of each of these different candidates. What do you think could be the most market-moving aspect of the State of the Union? from Joe Biden, considering that we haven't really heard what his trade policy is going to look like in a second term, what his fiscal policy is going to look like. Yeah, I think, number one, Lisa, would, would still be trade policy. And I, I don't just want to harp on that for, for redundancy, but do you think that, look, President Biden had the opportunity to redact uh, Trump-era tariffs, didn't do that, has had the opportunity to look at some of the micro-industries we pay attention to? That just has not been a central thrust. So for us, trade policy would be number two. Uh, number one. Number two would be fiscal policy. And I think that you've been right to, to cover this on this program very consistently. The idea that we have this lagged impact on fiscal. It is a, a steady drumbeat, if you will. It actually has been a tailwind for us in terms of being more macro positive, but it's not going to last indefinitely. So I think that number one would be trade policy, number two would be fiscal, and also the idea of, look, what measures are they willing to tackle from a fiscal perspective without, again, upsetting this economy, which remains still strong. Inflation Reduction Act, hard infrastructure, chips, all that fiscal money going out the door. When do you see that actually evaporating, though, in terms of the impact on the economy? Yeah, tapering probably, Emory, is like a first quarter of next year phenomenon, meaning that there's this lag. It's almost like monetary policy. It isn't a light switch that turns off and on. It's this dimmer switch, if you will, that has an elongation effect. So, again, by our estimates, we think that it's probably going to be a dissipation sometime in the first half of next year, but probably more pronounced in the first quarter. It can one if you want to make that apology again to the in-laws, just in case. It's fine. It's you early. Exactly. We've sorted that out. <laughs> He's like, I'll pass. Eric, thank you, mate. Eric Freeman there of US Bank Asset Management. Lisa, I think you nailed it. We've just been knee-deep into personalities. And I think for a lot of people in this country, and it shows up in the polling, this is not the trade-off, the face-off they wanted again. So we haven't focused on the policy. I think still now, even though we know it's going to be Biden versus Trump again, I don't think Wall Street is ready to focus on the policy just yet. We've heard from a number of people, we know what you're going to get. Do we? I mean, that's really the key question. Then we hear from other people, well, is it going to be the same kind of thing or do they double down on certain proposals that they couldn't get through the first term? We don't know the answer to that. But to me, this is what's going to be arguably more market moving than a lot of other things at a time where fiscal support has really been the tailwind driving a lot of this. Big time. Coming up next on this program, we'll catch up with Bloomberg's Craig Trudell on Tesla's tough start to the year losing more than a quarter of its market cap in a little more than two months. That conversation is coming up shortly. Equity futures on the S&P 500 doing OK. Just off session highs, we're positive by a third of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Stocks bouncing back on the S&P 500, positive by 0.4%. On the Nasdaq 100, doing all right as well, up by 07 Just in terms of the losses yesterday, biggest one-day move lower since the middle of February on the S&P, end of Jan on the Nasdaq 100. Lisa laughs every time I say it, so I'll give you the why. S&P 500 not suffered a drop of 2% or more in one day since February 2023. Longest run without such a pullback in six years. Thank you, Allegra Catelli here at Bloomberg for that stat. Bramo, we've been starved of big losses. Which is the reason why I keep asking, what is a dip? It's viable, but what is a dip? Does this count at a time where everyone seems to be saying the equities are actually the new haven because bonds don't offer you the offset to potential growth and potential ongoing inflation? Let's focus on some big losses yesterday for the likes of Tesla, that hit discretionary, the likes of Apple, that hit tech. But away from the equity market, the driver in the bond market was really some data we got at 10 a.m. Eastern time just yesterday. It was the services ISM and the employment component of that contractionary going into payrolls. So we've got a bid into the bond market, another one this morning, down a single basis point, Lisa, 454.74. Are we going to get a repeat of the jobs data of last month? Because certainly that data yesterday did not confirm the boom to start 24. The data's been really noisy. And this is what I felt yesterday, where you hear people basically saying, uh, taking both sides and not really having a clear view. If you took a look just at the ISM services data, not only did you get employment that came in in contractionary territory, but also prices paid came in below expectations, so less inflation. Other people are saying, well, there's a seasonality behind January, and February is going to be just as big of a boom. We just heard that from Kara Kadana. Put those two things together, soup, you hear voice. I mean, really, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> Can you explain this? Gold. Six-day winning streak on gold, all-time high. Yesterday, again this morning, gold right now, Lisa, 21.33. What is behind this move? I am not going to explain that to you. I will just say that some people will speculate that it has to do with Fed policy and the potential to allow the economy to run hot, inflation. Gold has not moved in a predictable manner. Sometimes when people are worried about inflation, we saw this back last year, Gold didn't get a bid. Now people are talking about a store of value again at a time where inflation's coming in uh, and you potentially have Fed cutting rates. Big questions here about whether this can continue. It's getting a bit now, that's for sure. Six-day winning streak for gold this morning. Longest daily winning streak going back to October 2022. That's the price action. Under surveillance this morning, our top stories. Day one of Chair Powell on Capitol Hill, about two and a half hours away. Powell expected to reiterate a lack of urgency for the Fed to cut rates amid growing concerns about upside risk to inflation. Andrew Honhorst and the team over at City expecting a neutral tone, with the Fed chair likely to highlight the need for more data and the importance of not overstating one data point in the wake of the hotter than expected January CPI print, together with that blowout payroll support. So we end up on payrolls Friday all over again. These comments are going to come before that data drops on Friday. Will Friday's data confirm that 350, whatever it was, 353 yeah. for the month of January? And some people are saying it probably will, that there was actually quite a bit of strength under the hood. We heard that again from Carl and from a host of other people who've come out and said that. What I think is going to be fascinating is that we're all looking at Friday's data. Are we seeing a Fed that is seriously de-emphasized at a time where the data is noisy and people are looking to other inputs to continue this risk rally? Not necessarily Fed policy in the way that people were last year and the year before. Because certainly stocks have done okay in the face of repricing rates a whole lot higher than we thought they would be through most of this year. Just getting this report from Torsten Slock over at Apollo. Torsten, thank you as always. Reasons for a strong February employment report. He offers four, Bramo. Financial conditions have eased dramatically. Jobless claims remain very low. The fiscal deficit is running high. There you go on that deficit point again. And the employment to population ratio is almost a full percentage point lower than pre-COVID. And this speaks to his point that the Fed may not cut rates at all or probably won't cut rates at all this year. But equities could keep rallying because you've got those tailwinds of the fiscal uh, support. You have the idea of a low unemployment and you have a really strong labor market. And that's the economy. Let's turn to the politics just briefly. Donald Trump, Joe Biden heading for a November rematch after securing sweeping victories in Super Tuesday primaries. And Nikki Haley, Trump's last rival for the GOP nomination, is ending her campaign. She's expected to speak in her home state of South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Trump and Biden winning almost every Super Tuesday contest. 
demonstrating their hold over their parties. And it's their hold over those parties that is going to get interesting in the next couple of days. Because when we hear from the President of the United States, Joe Biden, tomorrow evening, he's going to be speaking to people within his own party, not just the country. He's got to really get that party united and fast. So within his own party, we saw again overnight in Minnesota, uncommitted votes, about 20 percent, which is not anything that you can just shrug off if you're sitting in this campaign. So pockets within his own party needs to speak to. And then the broader electorate, what Greg Vallier was talking about, with polls and polls continue to show, majority of Americans just think he is too old. So again, for me, it's not so much what Biden says, it's how he says it. How does he come out and communicate this in a robust manner that people feel like, okay, we are giving him another four years and we feel confident about those four years? People look at those uncommitted votes and I think they point to the Middle East. I do wonder if it's more than just one single issue driving those uncommitted votes. Well, when it came to Michigan, you saw a huge rally amongst Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, progressive Gen Z, who are saying that it was about a protest vote over what's happening in Gaza. It could be about other issues, frankly. Uh, it could be about when you look at Gen Z, they feel like he hasn't done enough on student loans. You look at other individuals say inflation is still too high. I. Prices have not come to where I remember they were under the former president. But these are, at the moment, just protest votes. But he does have a lot of work to do. Let's turn to the MAG7 and talk about some of the movers we've got on the screen at the moment. Tesla, over the last few days, has really struggled, continuing to fall away from the MAG7, now facing issues in Germany, where a factory has yet to reopen after a nearby electricity tower was set on fire. An organization called Volcano Group claimed the arson, saying, we sabotage Tesla. Ben Callow of Baird saying investors should lower expectations for how many vehicles the company will deliver this quarter. This has been a really tough start to the year for this company. Bloomberg's Craig Trudeau joins us now for more. Craig, I want to understand from your perspective, first of all, what on earth is going on with production at that factory? And then you can tell me whether this is actually probably not so much of a bad time to lose production, given what's happening with demand worldwide. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if, if you're just following uh, Elon Musk's posts on X, you, you think, uh, wait a minute, you know, some, some lefties in Germany have lost the plot and decided to disrupt uh, an electric car factory. You know, what are you thinking? Uh, in, in reality, uh, on, on the ground, there's real local opposition to this company expanding uh, in what is, you know, a, a forested area. They cleared a ton of trees uh, to make room for this plant. Uh, that that was unpopular. It's a, a an area that doesn't have a ton of uh, of water uh, that has a sort of uh, troubling long term trend for the water supply. Uh, Tesla has not, uh, you know, taxed the water supply to the extent that was feared in the early goings, in part because it has decided not to go forward with making batteries on site. But, you know, that's a, a threat down the line. So, you know, there is real, po uh, you know, popular uh, opposition uh, to this company expanding uh, in Germany. Uh, that's not to say that it, it wasn't, uh, you know, an extreme action. Whoever uh, did set the fire to this uh, electricity, uh, you know, infrastructure nearby. Uh, but it, it has shut things down and it's unclear how long this plan is going to be out of commission for. When you say that dissatisfaction is popular, is it hardly local just around that particular factory, that plant? Or does it spread right the way through Germany into parts of Europe? It, it's I'm definitely referring to the highly local, uh, you know, opposition, uh, you know, in, in regards to actually a, a recent vote as to whether or not the public supported the company expanding. And I do think, of course, you know, it's, it is fair to, to wonder to what extent there is uh, some, you know, sort of quiet opposition to Tesla getting any bigger in Germany as a result of the fact that the company has had so much success in Germany and in Europe broadly. Uh, with uh, really, you know, making uh, quite a bit of a, a dent in, uh, you know, the position of, of local manufacturers. Uh, I don't think that we've necessarily seen or heard a, a ton of that out in the public. And, and, you know, you do, for the most part, hear other car company uh, executives talk about the idea of, look, you know, uh, Tesla is, is welcome here and, and we sort of welcome the fight. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the case that this is, you know, some grand conspir conspiracy uh, of, you know, German car makers uh, sort of, you know, looking out for their own. Taking a step back, there is a stat that Tyler Cowen, a Bloomberg opinion columnist, put out there that U investment, U.S. investments in clean energy and transportation grew 38 percent from 2022 to 2023, largely fueled by Bidenomics, largely fueled by U.S. subsidies. Are they working? Is it actually creating a dominance of U.S. EV manufacturers or is it kind of lagging behind as the adoption rate doesn't catch up with some of the push? 
Yeah, I, I think the U.S. is having real challenges. And, you know, there, there's been a lot of, you know, conversations early this year about, you know, uh, are, are we sort of are, are we said sort of getting this transition right, whether you want to talk about uh, the IRA and some of the execution issues that we're seeing there? I think it's it's hard to say that that has been a disappointment in the sense that, you know, the amount of investment that's going into the U.S. is massive and it's hard to understate the response that the IRA has gotten. But this is an industry with long lead times that takes years to go from, you know, announcing a, a big uh, splashy battery factory that's going to go up and actually having cells coming off the line, even if you're a company like uh, Tesla, which, you know, has, has struggled to sort of hit the numbers that it was hoping for with its battery factory out in, in Nevada. So uh, this is something that, you know, politicians are going to be tested as to whether or not, you know, they have the stomach for the idea that there's going to be growing pains. Uh, and on the consumer side, I do think, too, the fact that we, we wanted to incentivize EVs, but we wanted to cut China out of the equation. If we really are serious about that, it means, you know, we're going to have to deal with some, some cost disadvantages until we get to a point of, of scale and, and EVs really hitting the mainstream. Craig, I want to talk to you about the IRA and Tesla specifically, because Elon Musk seems to be dipping his toes into politics. We've confirmed New York Times reporting that on Sunday he was at Mar-a-Lago. This is a time when Trump really needs to bring in more uh, donor money. How much is Elon Musk, how much is Tesla benefiting from these subsidies from the Biden administration? It, it's incredible because on one hand, uh, they're a huge beneficiary of, of the IRA. And on the other hand, uh, Musk will sort of have you believe that the Biden administration is anti-Tesla. And, you know, there, there's, of course, you know, some uh, merit to the idea that, you know, there, there was uh, very sort of puzzling uh, snubs early on in this administration of, you know, the, the Biden administration wanting to welcome car makers to the White House uh, to, to make a lot of noise about the EV transition that, that Biden is trying to make. Uh, of course, he has you know, tried to make that uh, a message of looking out for U.S. workers and particularly uh, union workers. And the fact that Tesla uh, is, is not uh, unionized and Musk is very anti-union has been a source of great tension between these two. So it's, it's kind of incredible that you know, the IRA has, has been you know, such a boon to Tesla and yet, if you're sort of following Musk's uh, social media posts, you would think otherwise. Hey, Craig, great to get your thoughts. Craig Trudeau there of Bloomberg. Without a doubt, you can go back a couple of years. Elon Musk and Tesla were slighted by this administration to not be included in that. This company almost single-handedly part of the EV revolution in this country to be left out over union workers. It didn't make sense then, doesn't make sense now at all. Which raises this question, was it something more personal with respect to the allegiance of where his, uh, his shift was? It's, that said, the fact that his company is still benefiting from some of the EV transition and some of the U.S. policies uh, really uh, highlights how this is a fraught and sometimes counterintuitive moment for the industry. This was in 2021, and I was at this event, and I think it really came down to union jobs. President Joe Biden promised to be the most pro-labor union president in American history, so he wasn't going to open the door to Tesla. That said, Elon Musk has said he voted for Biden in 2020, but he said he wasn't sure who he'd vote for. And he has just ramped up his rhetoric ever, ever since that, even most recently saying it's treason what Biden is doing at the southern border. So it's interesting now that he goes to Mar-a-Lago at a time when Trump really could use those campaign, that campaign donation. The Tesla in the pre-market is doing all right. It's just positive. On the year, though, dreadful start to 2024. Equities more broadly positive, close to session highs up by 0.4%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Senator Bob Menendez has been indicted again in connection with an ongoing bribery case. Federal prosecutors added obstruction of justice charges to existing criminal counts against Menendez and his wife. Many Democrats have called on the New Jersey senator to step down after he was initially indicted last September. Meanwhile, independent Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema has announced she won't run for a second term. Her decision ends a possibility of a turbulent race in one of the nation's most politically competitive states. Foot Locker shares lower in the pre-market by nearly 11 percent. The retailer reported mixed earnings. It saw comparable store sales fall much less than expected, with consumers holding strong despite fears of a pullback on sportswear spending. But the company's full-year guidance failed to meet expectations. The company is anticipating that it will take longer to achieve the goal in its lace-up plan. 
Wells Fargo is set to unveil a new credit card aimed at competing with the Chase Sapphire Preferred program. Sources tell Bloomberg the firm is planning to add $95 per year travel-focused card to its roster as soon as this week. Wells Fargo will also add transfer partners, including Air France, British Airways, Choice Hotels, to its reward platform for the first time. The new card is part of the CEO Charlie Scharf's mission to make Wells Fargo a bigger player in the consumer space. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. I'm next on the program. Markets awaiting day one of Chairman Powell. He's speaking on behalf of the broader committee, so it's not his opinion that uh, necessarily he could uh, express in the press conference. Uh, it is him testifying on behalf of the, the, the broader committee. A preview up next, live from New York. Good morning. Session highs on the S&P up here by 0.4%. Yields just about unchanged on a 10-year, 4.1487. Under surveillance this morning, markets awaiting day one of Chairman Powell. He's speaking on behalf of the broader committee, so it's not his opinion that uh, necessarily he could uh, express in the press conference. Uh, it is him testifying on behalf of the, the, the broader committee. And I think that, uh, you know, we've been in an exceptional period recently where Everyone is singing out of the same uh, hymnal at the Fed. Everyone is saying there's no hurry to start moving, but it does seem appropriate uh, to start moving sometime relatively soon. Here's the latest this morning. Treasury's muted ahead of Jay Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill. The Fed chair expected to reiterate the central bank is in no rush to cut rates as inflation hovers above their 2% target. Cassie Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management saying this. We still appear to be on track for inflation to fall enough for the Fed to deliver some cuts this year starting in June. The Fed themselves is projecting core PCE to be at 2.4% at year end and to deliver three rate cuts. Cassie, I'm pleased to say... Joins us right now. Cassie, good to see you. Good to see you. Does the strong data to start 2024 change this conversation in any way, shape or form? I don't think so. Um, so we've gotten strong data, but we want to look at things not just one month, but we want to look at them more holistically. And so I think what you're seeing is you're seeing inflation that has come down a lot. Core PCE and headline PCE both have two handles on them as it relates to the year over year rates. I mean, that is a lot of progress from just a year ago. And then when I look at the broader uh, economic landscape, things are strong. But what I'm watching for is the risk that they're reaccelerating. And right now, I still see that risk of reacceleration as fairly low. So look at GDP, for example. It was at 4.9% in Q3. Then it went down to 3.2% in Q4. Now it's tracking 2% uh, as of the Atlanta Fed's latest GDP tracker. You know, that's the moderation that the Fed is seeing. That's what's giving the confidence to still say, yeah, you know, by middle of this year, we can reduce the amount of policy restriction. 5% maybe not so necessary when you have a two handle on inflation and growth is slowing. Even if growth does reaccelerate, there are some questions about whether that matters. Chairman Powell himself said, we don't look at strong growth as a problem. Do you look at strong growth as a problem? No, and I think the difference is, again, this differentiation between growth being strong and growth being reaccelerating or being unsustainable. So that's why I think the labor market data is so important today. And for me, before the jobs report on Friday even comes out, my eyes are actually on the jolts report today. So our favorite leading indicator for wages is the quits rate. And you can think about the quits rate as essentially being um, the bargaining power that the employee has, right? You don't quit your job unless you're confident you can get another one and you're most likely doing that to get a raise. Particularly here in the US when you don't have the same labor union structure that you do outside the US. So we're watching the quits rate. The quits rate right now, even if it stayed where it is, is indicating that wage pressures should be about the same level that they were pre-COVID. Again, these are the types of things that the Fed is seeing to make them confident that it's still appropriate to cut rates this year. What would you have to say to be confident that maybe there isn't the same kind of bullish trend in the Treasury market, particularly long duration treasuries, that you've been particularly bullish on for the better part of almost a year now? That's right. I, so far this year, essentially, the best strategy for managing duration risk has been to fade the extremes, right? We look back and we say, wow, seven rate cuts for 2024, that, that was probably too much. You look at when the 10-year broke below 
this year, it was only really on the back of the headlines of the regional bank stress in New York Community Bank. We, we haven't really been able to sustainably fall below four, but we also haven't been able to sustainably stay above um, for 4.3%. Uh, so I remember the last time I was on, we were talking about the 100 day moving average and the 10 year treasury being 4.3%. And we were asking the question, if we get the strong PCE inflation report that we expected to get because we had just gotten PPI and we were talking about PPI feeding into PCE and the stronger inflation report for January, could we break out of that range? And I said, I don't think so yet because it's only January, right? The Fed is projecting that the core PCE rate will get to 2.4% by the end of the year. They don't need to get to 2% to cut, and we still have 11 months to go. So far, that, that level, that 430 level, has held. And again, we could test it with the right set of data, and that data is coming hard and fast in the next five days. But for now, um, we're essentially kind of in a range trade, and it's still an opportunity to lock in those yields uh, before they start to move lower. Okay, this is something I'm a broken record with today. Jim Karen came out and said fiscal policy arguably is more important than monetary policy for him. He's going very underweight, investment grade credit in particular. We can get into that in just a second, talking about spreads and how it's really closely tied to duration. But he also talks about the fiscal and the overhang. How closely are you watching what proposals there are to see when you have to care about the deficit again? So, I mean, the deficit matters, and I think it has been an underlying force that's been keeping the economy stronger than we otherwise would have anticipated. And it's been pushing against monetary policy, which has been restrictive. On the other side, you've had fiscal that's been loose. But I think it's interesting, you know, when it comes to investment grade credit, um, the corporate fundamentals are just really strong. I mean, we were just going through our scorecards as a team yesterday in our investor meeting, and there are just no places to pull coals, particularly in investment grade, but also in high yield credit right now. So you have fundamentals that are strong. You have spreads that are narrow relative to the recent history. But what we're doing now is we're not looking at the recent history. We're looking at other periods of time where fundamentals and technicals were as strong as they are today. And in those environments, spreads can actually stay very tight and even go tighter um, than the levels we're at right now. So this is a really unusual time. You're looking at tight spreads, saying they can go even tighter. We're looking at the equity market that's near all time highs. And at the same time, we're talking about the Fed cutting interest rates. Can you make sense of that? How unique is this moment? I think it, it is unique. I mean, when I think about how unique this cycle has been, I think about the fact that, you know, there are leading indicators that have just been wrong so far this cycle, and we, we don't know what the ultimate end of this cycle will be. Um, you know, we thought that with 500 basis points of rate hikes, and the fastest, most aggressive monetary policy cycle um, in, in 30 years that we were going to have a recession. I mean, that was our expectation last year. I think you have to adjust when the facts change. And essentially what we've discovered is that there's an underlying resilience that just can't be ignored. When we talk about the resilience, we've been talking about bad news being bad news again. And I know people are rolling their eyes. I'm rolling my eyes at myself. But there's this question of negative economic data actually being negative, even if it means more rate cuts. Is that negative for credit as well? If we see a real turning in the economy, would that cause you to rethink both the investment grade and the high yield theses? So I think that high quality fixed income, I think, is in a really sweet spot right now in terms of the potential economic outcomes, right? Like we're grappling with what's coming next. And I see three paths forward. You have a soft landing. That's one option. You have a, a recession. It finally comes. The thing that we were all expecting, all the leading indicators that failed finally work. Or you get the reacceleration, which we've talked about the reasons why, why we believe the reacceleration is the lowest probability of the three. If you think about how high quality fixed income is gonna perform in the soft landing and in the recession, they're both very good outcomes for high quality fixed income. So in a soft landing, you collect the carry, the Fed delivers on the rate cuts. You don't necessarily get a lot more than the yield on the index, but the yield on the index is pretty good relative to history. If you get the recession, then the Fed cuts more, you also get the capital appreciation. And like you mentioned, we do think that bonds are gonna work as a diversifier. 
in yep. your portfolio again. And we've seen little microcosms of that happening so far this year, like the headlines from the regional banks. We, the bonds did act the way were, they were supposed to in those moments. So much more constructive. Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management. Kelsey, thank you. In the next hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with Kate Moore of BlackRock, Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, Tom Porcelli of PGM, and Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho. Two hours away from Chairman Powell on Capitol Hill. From New York, this is Bloomberg. When you have a productivity surge like we are having right now, you can have the economy continue to be fairly strong while inflation continues to moderate. I don't understand the sticky inflation argument. If there is still a recession at some point, the market hasn't priced it. All of the ingredients are kind of there for a sustained expansion of the U.S. economy. It really does boil down to that we are simply not slowing down. Where is the slowdown? It feels like we're in that kind of sweet spot of benign disinflation and Goldilocks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now. Chairman Powell testimony on Capitol Hill to hours away. It is all about jobs day to this hour. 15 minutes from now, the ADP employment report a little bit later this morning. Job openings on to tomorrow. Jobless claims. Then the big one Friday. Ramo Payroll's Friday just around a corner. I was wondering how long it was going to take before you mentioned ADP report. It comes 15 minutes before the ADP report comes out. Look, all of the tea leaves are important. The data's been messy. I do think that the Jolts report, given what we just heard from Kelsey Barrow, is going to be really important to basically either confirm or dispute what we saw yesterday from ISM services. The Tolson's Lock Apollo said reasons to be constructive on Friday. One of them out of four jobless claims. Claims tomorrow. Lisa, we're still looking at claims at 215. 215,000, which is incredibly low given how long rates have had a five handle in America. If you're looking for weakness, you got to look hard. You got to look at the hours worked. You've got to look at some of the quits rates. You've got to look around the edges at some of the commentary. Given that, this data is getting so much messier because you can pick and choose what you want to, but the overlying headline numbers strong, strong, strong. Unemployment not picking up. 353,000 jobs created in January. Does that get revised lower or do we just keep on chugging? Forgive me for what I'm about to say because it sounds so harsh. If you're looking for weakness, look to South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> Nikki Haley, really weak showing on Super Tuesday <laughs> and most reports suggesting dropping out later this morning. Yeah, she'll be dropping out. Uh, that's what reporters, even Bloomberg has now reported uh, following on the Wall Street Journal. You know, Matthew Bartlett said yesterday it's not a presidential campaign, it's a messaging campaign. So the next question is, does she continue the message? And she's got quite critical of the former president in the last few months. Does she continue that messaging campaign or does she endorse him? And that's what everyone's going to be looking at. Because if Donald Trump wants to encompass the whole party, it means bringing her voters along with him. And right now he's not. And that showed last night as well on Super Tuesday. I'm going to just offer a little hope right now. This is where I basically say we've talked a lot about... Well, who is going to be in the race? It's been Trump and Biden the whole time. Now we know definitively it's Trump and Biden. Are we going to hear something substantive and more focused on what their second terms would look like should either of them win? Now that Nikki Haley is out of the picture officially, do we start to shift to really what are they going to be like if they get second terms? We'll have a realistic conversation then. Let's look to tomorrow, tomorrow evening. All reports suggest that we might hear something from the president about capital gains. I mean, we hear something from capital gains. That's politics. That's not policy. Because as we've seen over the last couple of years, they can't get it done. They can't get it done when everything's blue. Why are they going to be able to get it done in the next term? Well, he's going to be playing to a lot of different constituents within his own party when the president speaks tomorrow evening. A number of things he's going to want to talk about, especially taxing the rich. When you talk about policies that could remain the same under Trump or Biden, tax cuts, not for everyone, but definitely those under $400,000, maybe $500,000. Democrats, maybe you could see a slight inch up higher in corporate gains, but it completely depends on the shakeup of the House and the Senate. And what Lisa's talking about and some of the analysts you've seen, it looks like a mixed government. It's going to be a divided government. So then you could expect not a lot to happen. What both leaders will do is spend, 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 because, Lisa, that's exactly what they have done over the last eight years. OK, so if that's what happens, then when do you get the bond market pushback? I do think, again, fiscal is so important. We hear that from everybody, that that's been the driving force. So at what point does that end? And if it doesn't, when does the bill have to get paid? Taxes and tariffs. You're going to hear a lot about that in the next few months. Equity futures right now on the S&P. Session highs up by 0.5. 
5% on the S&P 500 jobs data just around a corner. In the bond market, yields lower by a single basis point, 414 on a US 10-year. In foreign exchange, the euro stronger, dollar weaker, 108. 72. Coming up this hour, BlackRock's Kate Moore looking ahead to Chair Powell's testimony. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence reacting to ADP data and PGM's Tom Porcelli previewing Friday's payrolls report. We begin with our top story. It's Chair Powell day one. The Fed chair heading to Capitol Hill where he's expected to reiterate the central bank's call to wait and see on rate cuts. BlackRock's Kate Moore saying this. While prices continue to moderate, inflation is still running above target and we believe the Fed needs to feel a higher degree of confidence confidence before rushing to cut rates. We view rate cuts will likely be appropriate in 24 and we believe that a June 1st cut is realistic. Kate Moore joins us now for more. Kate, great to catch up with you ahead of this testimony from Chairman Powell. We've pushed out the timing of the call. We've reduced the magnitude and stocks have done OK. A theme for us this morning is just how important, how relevant is monetary policy to this equity market as we speak? I think people are still fixated, of course, on inflation and on kind of the messaging and tone from monetary policy decision makers. That said, if you kind of look at the internals, John, and, and, and what has been performing within the equity market, it has been fundamentals that have been dri driving stock prices much more than just expectations around inflation. So when we initially got excited about inflation coming down, a disinflationary trend, and rate cuts in 2024, there was a pop in some really kind of lower quality stuff that was getting hit hard um, on higher rates for longer. But what is performed today and what is performing right now in this market? are companies that are putting up good numbers on earnings, that have been raising guidance, and that have very strong fundamentals. So look, we're going to talk about it till we're blue in the face. Inflation and Fed policy and parsing all of the um, speeches is going to be what we do uh, for hours on end. That said, we really have to focus on what companies can perform in this economy in order to make money. OK, for years, you and I were talking about pricing power. When inflation was high, they had this ability to kick up prices and boost margins. Have you been impressed by their ability to preserve margins, given the backdrop currently? Yeah, John, I think you're, you're asking this question because you know I have great faith and confidence in the U.S. corporate sector to continue to maintain margins, even through lots of last year where prices were rising and where there was um, a lot of strain. We saw companies continuously focus on maintaining margins and think about strategies that would allow them to expand their margins in 2024. I'm actually very optimistic, and I think this is the consensus of a lot of analysts on the street, that margins will gradually expand over the course of this year as prices come down and as companies continue to focus, have this laser focus um, on maintaining and expanding margins. This is going to be critical for the fundamentals. And as I said, the fundamentals are going to underpin equity risk and sentiment, I think, for the balance of this year. So you're over Overweight risk assets, strongly mm -hmm. overweight risk assets, piling on, sh shrugging off all the bubble talk. Are bonds a good diversifier? Or right now, are they the toxic ones at a time of concern about deficits and inflation being stickier for a longer period of time? Yeah, look, we have a significant portion of our portfolio in bonds, but we're not massively overweight when it comes to, say, treasuries. <laughs> you know, we're seeing a more opportunity in the credit side. I think the fixed income plays an important part in a balanced like allocation portfolio. That said, there are lots of parts of fixed income that are more attractive than others. And we've used cash as a tool aggressively over the last you know, 12 to 18 months. We're seeing more alternatives and currency opportunities as well. So I think we need to think holistically about the asset class opportunity set, even though, Lisa, and you know this, I'm very constructive on equities for the balance of the year. We're going to get this periodic pullbacks. Uh, but I think that is where you're going to deliver the bulk of your returns for a multi-asset portfolio. Kate, I've been putting together a project where I'm trying to collect all the worries and put them on a list and then tick them off as people basically shrug them off. Do you have any? to put on the list. <laughs> of course. I mean, I barely slept last night thinking about all of my worries. No, Lisa, for <laughs> sure. Um, there are a couple of things that really concern me. You know, one of the things I'm focused on, and we were paying attention to this with Target reporting yesterday, uh, was what is the true health of the U.S. consumer? Some of the data gets amassed by the higher end or kind of, we'll think about the upper two quintile of earners. Um, and, you know, does low end consumer continue to show cracks and what does discretionary demand look like? I worry a little bit about that. I frankly worry a little bit about the election cycle having an impact on overall spending. We've seen in previous election cycles that uh, companies pull back or hold back on uh, non-essential capex as they're waiting for, you know, 
trying to figure out who the next administration is going to be and what that policy will look like. So I worry that that could have a dampening effect on overall economy. And then I worry a, a decent amount around the impact that geopolitical risk uh, and geopolitical tensions could have on multinationals in terms of their overall operations. Does any of this like take my enthusiasm out of the S&P and NASDAQ? Not fully, but I think these are things that could be risks for certain sectors as we look through the year. OK, it was going through your old calls at the end of last year. Credit where it's due. Top favourite markets, US one, Japan the other. US up by 6.5%, Nikkei 225 up 20% this year. What was it that you liked about Japanese equities? What is it that you still like about Japan? We've seen a, a bunch of small green shoots, I would say, across the Japanese equity space. And the, there was also a large positioning and technical technical component, John. You know, Japanese equities have been underloved for some time. Uh, we continue to see, you know, stronger growth across Asia and with some of the trading partners that we thought would bolster earnings uh, across the Japanese uh, corporate sector. And we, like a lot of people, remain hopeful that we will continue to see a change in BOJ policy over the balance of this year, which will change sentiment for the overall asset class. I will say U.S. is our largest overweight by a long stretch, and that's where we're taking our concentrated equity risk. But I think Japan continues to um, bear some fruit and will continue to have an overweight there through coming quarters. Some pretty decent fruit, that's for sure. Kate Moore of BlackRock, congrats on the call. Big call. Japan, just massive outperformance year to date so far. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley is said to end her campaign after poor showing in a string of primary contests, setting up a rematch of the 2020 election in November. Haley is due to speak in her home state of South Carolina at 10 a.m. Eastern. Former President Donald Trump swept the Super Tuesday primaries, winning all races except Vermont. Tesla's factory in Germany remains closed after a fire at a nearby electricity tower halted production, adding to the car maker's strains. The company said it doesn't know when production will resume at the factory, which makes about 6,000 cars a week. Tesla stock has fallen almost 11% just in this week alone, driven in part by a plunge in shipments from its Shanghai factory. House Speaker Mike Johnson will host the parents of imprisoned Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Ger Gershkovich at the State of the Union. Ellen Milan and Mikhail Gershkovich will meet with Johnson privately before President Biden's address. He was detained by Russian authorities almost a year ago and has been held on allegations of espionage that he, the Journal, and the U.S. government deny. The U.S. government has designated Gershkovich as wrongfully detained. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. I'm next on this program. ADP payrolls data ahead of the big event on Friday. What we expect to get from the payrolls um, is a sequential calling from the very hot print that we saw last month, but a still robust uh, payroll print. The ADP jobs report coming up next. You know the one that people say it doesn't really matter and then it depends what happens and it kind of does for five minutes. That's coming up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, equity futures rallying into the ADP report. Futures positive by a half of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up by 0 0.8. The number we're looking for, 150K. The previous number, 107. In the bond market, the scores going into that print look like this. On a two-year, yield to lower by a single basis point, 452.32. Down a basis point on a 10-year, 413.70. With the jobs data, here's Mike McKee. Hey, Mike. Hey, John, we come in a little lower than anticipated, but you've got to remember ADP doesn't match up very well with what the government provides us on Friday. 140,000 jobs is what they see were created in the month of February. That is up from 107, which was their initial print last time. The uh, forecast for uh, the Friday jobs payroll report is over 200,000. Now, ADP doesn't c contain government jobs, so they're not going to match up exactly, but the track record is they've been way off in recent months, of course, 107,000 last time, and we got 353,000 for January payrolls. The other news that they put into this is their new pay numbers and the median change in annual pay for job stayers, 5.1 percent, for job changers, 7.6 percent. So not a lot of slowing in that. It'll be interesting to see how this compares with what we get on Friday, guys, because, of course, the Fed 
Fed would be looking for numbers more like ADPs than what we've been getting from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So Mike McKee has been really diplomatic about this, but I think the ultimate takeaway is nothing to see here. The equity market at session highs by 0.5% on the S&P. I'll turn to the bond market briefly. Give it the scores as you were. We're down about a basis point on a two-year, 4.54 on a 10-year, down two basis points. Just a small break of 4.14 here, 4.13.50. Mike, perhaps more instructive is the data that we got yesterday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. When you look at the ISM services, the employment component of it, and it drops back into contraction territory, Mike, can you tell us how important that read actually is? Well, it is an important signal. Whether it actually translates into any kind of drop is hard to say because they don't match up exactly, but it does suggest that the hiring process has leveled out and maybe uh, might even be uh, sort of frozen at this point. We got down to 48 uh, for services industry hiring, and of course, we have seen negative numbers for manufacturing hiring. For many months, uh, companies were just uh, hiring anybody who would walk in the door, and now it seems they've probably probably filled up their payrolls and they're waiting to see what's going to happen with the uh, economy. Uh, interesting uh, number out this morning, the Business Roundtable CEO uh, confidence level reached its highest in two years. So maybe we'll start to see hiring pick up again if the CEO's uh, attitudes are any indication of where the economy is going. Let's talk about whispers, given the fact that we've seen uh, some conflicting data with respect to the labor market. How has that affected the whisper number for the jobs report that we get on Friday at a time where we caught, for example, Torsten Slock this morning saying there's reasons to think it's going to be a really positive February number? Well, it is kind of interesting, Lisa, because uh, in previous months, we've seen the whisper number significantly higher than what the forecast number is. But that's not the case this time. They're only slightly, Wall Street's only slightly above where the uh, forecast of their economists is. So it may be that uh, we're seeing some sort of coming together in terms of this whole idea that maybe hiring has slowed somewhat, whether we see a uh, significant decline from 353 or whether we get 200 or over, uh, all, both of those outcomes are not what the Fed wants to see. They'd like to see it even slower. So if you're looking for a hawkish signal one way or another on Friday, it would be the strength of payrolls. Mike, I love today because we get a whole host of data and we're going to hear all these people telling us why it doesn't really matter and it just sort of pushes us in the muddle that we're in. Does Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony matter? We're going to be getting that later this morning at a time where a lot of people say there's nothing to see here. He's basically going to come out and say they're in no rush and repeat what he's already said. That's pretty much what's expected. There's no percentage in it for Jay Powell to change any kind of testimony, any kind of pattern uh, that the Fed has adopted. And as you mentioned, everybody on the Fed has basically said the same thing. We need more evidence that inflation is going down. So I would expect that's what you get out of the written testimony. Now, what do we see in the Q&A? Maybe depends on how things are phrased. Every once in a while, something drops. So that's always a possibility. You've got to pay attention to everything he says. But I wouldn't think he's coming into this to make news. Interesting. Mike, thank you. Mike McKee, stay close. Mike McKee's going to stand by because the last few times we've had Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill, the pre-prepared remarks have been released around 8.30 Eastern time. So I think that's something we're all going to look out for in about 10 minutes to see if we get a repeat of that. So we'll catch up with Mike again in just a moment. Let's go through that data again together. So the ADP report, I think we're going to move on from this pretty quickly. 140. 140 was the number. 150 was the estimate. The previous number was a revised 111. And since there's nothing to see here, this equity market run continues uh, by 0.5% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, higher by 0.9. This is a bounce back from yesterday's losses and maybe a bit of an appetizer for the jobs data you'll get later. Jobs, job openings coming later this morning. Jobless claims coming tomorrow. Then onto payrolls on Friday. Lisa, even with that negative print, in the ISM report, the employment component of it for services. Payrolls, the estimate in our survey, can change, of course, is still 200K. And we're hearing that. We heard that from Cara Gadano. We heard that from Torsten Slock, that the expectation is for a stronger uh, labor market report than some people are even expecting. Is services specific to really just this issue of trying to gauge whether things can go further rather than a real test to the overall economy? Let's get some commentary from Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, some reaction to these jobs numbers and a preview to Chairman Powell later on this morning. Ira, your thoughts on what we got from ADP and ultimately what we heard yesterday and what you're looking for on Friday? 
Yeah, so uh, I agree with what you had said before, John. You know, this is a come and go kind of number, uh, especially since it's uh, it's usually overshadowed by the uh, by the payrolls report. Importantly, what I'm looking for on Friday is is you know even if we get a 300 print or or 150 print on on payrolls, yeah, that that'll catch some attention. But it's really the the uh, job data, uh, the, the wage data, as well as the hours worked, because you know what's keeping and propping up the economy right now is consumer spending and consumers as long as they can con continue to get raises and continue to have disposable income increases, they'll continue to spend some of at least a large portion of those uh, of those wage, wage gains, and that will can keep the economy going for much longer. And, and I think that's something that will need to be addressed today by Chair Powell. Um, so 8.30, as you mentioned, the, the, last, uh, the, the last couple of years, we've gotten uh, the, a preview of those prepared remarks, uh, but it is the Q&A, like Mike McKee just mentioned. The, the Q&A is what matters, and, and when you look at the, the bond market and where all the volatility stems from, it's usually some off-the-cuff comment that occurs sometime between 10.30 and 12 <laughs> when when Powell's asked some crazy question and kind of has to, has to answer off the cuff. Is it 30 minutes, Ira, that that's how long it takes for him to get annoyed with them and just start saying <laughs> things? Well, you get the you get the the committee chair, the committee vice chair, uh, the the one of the subcommittee chairs. They all make their opening remarks. Then Powell does his opening commentary, which you know we will already uh, have had for a couple of hours by then. And then finally, around ten thirty is when the first uh, round of Q and A will start. Which is when he will be sufficiently tired and irritated to basically just say what he thinks. I am curious what it would take to break out of this range of say four ten to four thirty on the ten year yield, based on testimony that people aren't expecting a lot from. Yeah, I, I suspect it won't be toward lower yields because I, I think that, that Chair Powell is going to probably be a little bit more cautious about when they're going to start cutting interest rates and that will you know prop up uh, Treasury yields a little bit so prices down yields a little bit higher. Um, but it, it would take it would take him being much more dovish, right? The, so in order to get down below four percent on on ten year Treasury yields, I think he would have to suggest that that they see a more pronounced slowing in the economy than most of us see in the hard data that's coming out, right? You, you guys have talked about yesterday's ISM employment report. One of the interesting things that's been going on that we've highlighted over the last few weeks is you have the hard data, so things like payrolls and retail sales and that uh, look pretty good, whereas the survey data. Data. So the way that people feel uh, has started to you know roll over a little bit. You have you know some bad some uh, chinks in the survey data, but you know people don't necessarily do what they say, right? And 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 people are still spending money. People still have jobs. People are still hiring, even if it's not as at the same pace that they were a year ago. So um, so, so the economy is being propped up. So so I suspect for the long end of the treasury market, we're going to kind of hang out here. Whereas things like the two year yield, that's going to go up and down just based on on, you know, hey, is the Fed going to cut all the way to three and a half percent? Are they only going to cut to four percent? Um, that's what, where you'll see the front end can be much more volatile than than long end treasuries at this point. Ira, typically we frame this as a grinning on Capitol Hill and every single time we get it wrong. How political is this going to be ahead of the State of the Union tomorrow evening? I think it's going to be pretty political. I mean, you'll have things like just this morning, you had a letter from two uh, Republican senators. He's in front of the Senate tomorrow. He's in front of the House today. Um, yeah, you know, the, the House members tend to be very political. They all get a very short amount of time. Um, in fact, <laughs> it, it usually takes like three minutes for someone to ask a question because they're trying to, to grandstand. And then, you know, Powell has 15 seconds to say yes or no uh, effectively to some <laughs> to some question. Um, the, the Senate tends to be a little bit more highbrow. So I th actually tomorrow, May actually, you, you might actually provide more interesting information and detail and nuance than today's testimony will, just because of who's asking the question and how much time the members get to actually ask those questions. They've got campaign videos to make, Ira, you know that. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, thank you. Andrew's hot on horse, a city, just writing this one. Mr. Powell goes to Washington. This is what he's going to do, apparently. He is likely to push back against some calls to lower rates by emphasising that the Fed plans to cut rates later this year, but will proceed patiently and carefully to guard against re-accelerating inflation risks. What I find interesting, is it going to be Democrats and Republicans on the fringes both being on the same level, saying cut them, cut them aggressively? Really, I mean, it's at a certain point, start to converge. I imagine there's some Republicans that would quite like another few hikes going into the election. Sure, yes, right, you know, maybe like... I'm not sure know. those calls for cuts will quite be as, as loud as the other side of the aisle. Coming up next, P. Jim's Tom Porcelli looking ahead to Friday's payrolls report and a preview of Chairman Powell. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
the ADP report already very, very stale. Came in at 140. The estimate was 150K. Equities near session highs. Going into Chairman Powell's testimony, we're positive by a half of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up by 0.8%. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yields lower yesterday on that ISM services read, the employment component negative. We're lower again today. We're down two basis points on a two-year to 453.90. With those prepared remarks from Chairman Powell, they drop again at 8.30 Eastern. Mike McKee standing by to break it down for us. Hey, Mike. Hey, John, you were right about what time they are releasing the testimony. They end the suspense early, but there's almost no reason to. Uh, nothing for Wall Street to trade on here. This is all old news. Basically, Jay Powell saying what they have been saying for some time in their statements in the press conference. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain and ongoing progress toward our 2 percent inflation objective is not assured. He does give a little bit of a brief outline of where the economy is, strong job creation, inflation has come down, but there's farther to go before they can consider the idea of rate cuts. And he says cutting too soon, and they've said this before as well, risks inflation getting uh, out of control again, cutting too late risks recession, so they're going to do their best to stay on top of the economy and make sure that they time this correctly. But no hint about timing, nothing about the balance sheet. Uh, the Fed is basically on autopilot here for the uh, testimony of the chairman, which is only about two and a half pages long. So it is going to be, as we said earlier, the Q&A that will provide any news that we might get. And no big moves in this market either, just to go through them for you. Starting with stocks, equity still positive by half of 1%, up by 0.8% on the Nasdaq 100, a bounce back from the losses of yesterday. Yields were a little bit lower. They stayed there, but down a basis point or two year 454 on a 10 year down two basis points to 413 mike this line this word confidence it's a word that he used a phrase he used back at the end of january we've had a bit of data since then do you think he's gained confidence or lost confidence based on the economic data of the past month or so I think he may be questioning where we might be going. And I think Rafael Bostic from the Atlanta Fed earlier this week is kind of saying the quiet part out loud that there are signs maybe we're going to see a little more strength in the economy going forward, and that could push inflation up. Obviously, the CPI, the PCE coming in hotter than expected, uh, they are concerned about that if it develops into a trend, but it's only been one month. So they're not really going to question their assumptions at this point, but they're going to be on heightened alert. Mike, everyone's going to be watching and paying attention to this, but it does feel like the Federal Reserve and Fed Chair Powell has been de-emphasized in a market that's looking beyond to the data, to other types of factors and other types of spending. Would you agree with that? Well, I think at, at this point there's an awful lot going on uh, up here on Capitol Hill where uh, they're dealing with the budget, they're dealing with the election year. Uh, so, yes, the Fed has been de-emphasized some. Uh, it may be more important from a political standpoint because Republicans obviously don't want the Fed to be aggressively cutting rates into the election because that would be good for Joe Biden. And Democrats don't want the Fed on hold too long because that would not be good for Joe Biden. So in that sense, it matters. But the state of the economy is pretty good. And this is going to be one of those cases where no matter what party you're in, you're going to criticize the other party but go home and talk about things are pretty good in my district. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. It's always the way. Playing politics with the economic data. Mike McKee, one of the best down in Washington, D.C., breaking it all down for you. So about 18 minutes ago, 18 minutes ago, we had the data, the ADP report. That came in at 140,000. The estimate was 150. The previous number, a revised 111. Not too bad. Pretty decent in the grand scheme of things. What does it mean for Friday? Not much at all. But ultimately, on Friday, the estimate is pretty lofty. 200K is the median estimate in our survey. Then we've heard from Chairman Powell in the prepared remarks. A couple of quotes for you. Here's one. We believe that our policy rate is likely at the peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it would likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain and ongoing progress towards our 2% inflation objective is not 
assured. This was always about gaining confidence, Lisa. He talked about that at the end of January. We've had some data that I would say to some extent, and we can debate to what degree, but to some extent that data would have knocked their confidence just a little bit. Which is the reason why maybe someone could read into the idea that they're talking about peak policy rate is taking uh, the idea of another rate hike off the table, which somehow a new entered the conversation after some of this hotter than expected data. Otherwise, this is the calibration that they've been making. It's not telling us a lot of new information. Tom Porcelli joining us now out of PGM on the latest. Tom, you've had some time to digest those comments from Chairman Powell. Think about that economic data from earlier this morning. What's the big takeaway for you? Yeah, I, I think you set it up perfectly. It's like, is there really a big takeaway? <laughs> you know, it's the it, it, ADP sort of is that tree that falls in the forest that no one hears. Um, I think that there's some interesting stuff in there that we can talk about. Um, and I think Powell, you know, sort of hit one right down the middle, which is exactly what he was supposed to do. I mean, there was no reason to break new ground um, relative to what he said at the last presser. So um, I, I, I'd love to make this this really sort of engaging and, you know, sort of rip roaring conversation about Powell and ADP. But we, we'd have to stretch. Well, but Tom, so let's not, right? But this to me is interesting in <laughs> yes. and of itself, right? We don't have to. Uh, it's interesting yes, in yes. and of itself. I mean, I remember, I'm old yes. enough to remember when the Fed was everything and that's all the people tracked and that Fed policy drove the markets, Fed policy drove all economic thought. Have we moved yep. beyond that? Where suddenly Fed policy doesn't matter that much. It didn't matter in terms of restrictiveness, in terms of tightening this economy. And it's not gonna matter if they cut by 25 or 50 basis points. Yeah, I, so I think this is a really important idea, Lisa, and it's something that we've been sort of kicking around. You know, it's um, if I think about like the uh, the home builders, right? If I think about like new home sales, new home sales are sort of hanging in there, aren't they? Um, existing home sales are getting absolutely clobbered, um, but new home sales are hanging in there for uh, I think one really important reason. Um, the builders are are doing these paydowns, right? They're doing these mortgage paydowns, and if you speak to our home building um, team, what they would tell you is that it seems that there's some like magical number around 6%. If you offer sub 6% mortgage um, to, um, to for a potential buyer, they sort of leap at that. Now, that's interesting to me as an economist because I think, well, okay, mortgage rates you know, on average are around 7% right now. You know, if, 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 if the home builders are an example, um, then if the Fed cuts rates, you know, 75 to 100 basis points, which is what we expect, we're looking for 75 basis points, then all of a sudden you're at this sort of magical number. Why, why is that important? Not so much from a, hey, let's reignite sales, but let's maybe get some home equity extraction. I mean, I think this, if you know, think about the amount of home equity that's sort of, you know, in um, just sort of sitting out there idle, locked, because rates are so high. I, I think that's where sort of the rubber meets the road on this. I think it's an interesting idea that not a lot of people are talking about. So Tom, given that, do you think that the risk of reacceleration in the economy is that much greater? with a Fed still poised to cut at some point this year, and with an economy that's being fueled by fiscal stimulus and by consumer balance sheets that are pretty good. Yeah, balance sheets are pretty good, Lisa. And, you know, like I, I would say, look, we've been in the soft landing camp. I've been at PGM for eight months. We've been in the soft landing camp for eight months and maybe even a little bit longer than that. Um, and, and what I would say is, you know, when we were thinking about soft landing, you know, we were thinking of it in a range of, call it one to one and a half percent. Um, but you know you're easily in the upper end of that range now, and maybe even bleed a little bit uh, a little bit north of there. Um, so not making any wholesale changes, just sort of acknowledging that you know sort of things have come in a, a little bit better. We do recognize though, uh, you know, so one of the things I've been saying is, look, so sure, 24 I think is going to be a good year uh, from a growth perspective, full stop. I do think it's worth remembering how it's basically being driven, um, and it's being driven by credit usage, and it's being driven now by a drawdown in the muscle. Of saving, right? Forget about excess saving. Right? We we all we all appreciate that's long since gone. But if you look at um, uh, sort of you know the pool of saving that exists now, and if you look at that relative to you know where you would have been had the pandemic not happened, you're you're getting below that now, right? So you're cutting into saving muscle. Um, and and I say all of that to to highlight you know like how sustainable is that really? Um, you know, can you continue to sustain that um, over the coming um, couple of years? And the short answer is you sort of can. Um, I mean, you can continue to drift um, uh, into that saving muscle. You can continue to um, uh, use credit as much as those spigots remain open. So I think for the next couple of years, I think it's really easy to sort of make that case. Um, and I think the Fed is acutely aware of that, which is why I think when we think about cuts, the cuts to come, again, we've been in the three cut camp for a while. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think of that as anything other than this is a, you know, sort of the Fed just um, sort of right sizing um, policy, given the fact that inflation has slowed.
right-sizing policy to where it may end, which might be, say, 4.75%, which or something yeah, of that honestly, nature. Exactly. I mean, but this is really where I was going to go. When you talk about credit, yeah. you're referring to consumer credit, but really it's the credit of the yeah. full-faith U.S. government that's really been driving a lot of this. When does that yes. come home to roost? When is that a problem when it comes to the bond market, when it comes to understanding investor yeah. pushback? Yeah, you know, I think the reality is, you know, this is one of the benefits of being the world's reserve currency. You get a pass. Um, uh, you know, we, we haven't really seen, um, uh, you know, any, any notable backing away um, uh, uh, at large um, from, from treasuries. Uh, we were just at a monetary policy conference last week, and we sort of, this was one of the sort of the, the, the big takeaways. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily the right approach to managing your, your fiscal position, but I'm saying that's what is. Um, this is what's happening. So, I, look, when I think about fiscal policy um, going forward, I, I, I think, you know, it's going to be very difficult for fiscal policy to, to really provide any meaningful sort of thrust, um, you know, short of going, uh, providing consumers with some direct stimulus, which, as I think we all appreciate, is simply not happening. So I don't know that you get a lot of additional fiscal thrust um, over the coming year or, or even um, two. Uh, but it's it's out there, um, and it's uh, deficits are going to remain incredibly bloated for for the foreseeable future. Well, to Lisa's point, and almost obsession with this, what would happen yeah. first when fiscal policy be changed because of an issue and a mistake yeah. that potentially yeah. could happen in the bond market? You know, so here's here's an interesting um, thing that that I think everyone should sort of keep in mind. Um, you know. Recessions make fast friends of politicians. I mean, that, that, that's sort of almost always the case. And again, we don't have one built in right now. Um, we, well, our, we have relatively elevated um, probability of, of one, but you know, if steady state is 15%, we have 20%. Um, and, and, that, and that sort of modestly elevated um, proposition is mostly because uh, you know, we're, we're acknowledging that maybe there's a risk that um, the Fed does not cut at all. Um, but if, if, if that left tail risk does come to fruition, I think you have to acknowledge that no politician, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, um, likes to endure a recession. And I think that's the thing that could really sort of, you know, feed that, that the, the fiscal beast a, a bit more. So that, that's the tail risk, though, I, I would stress. And, and that's not where, uh, where we see things sort of shaking out. True. Hey, Tom, before you go, I just want to get your thoughts yeah. on payrolls on Friday. What yeah. are you and the team looking for? What should we be focused on? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, I, I think it could actually be a, a, a really uh, sound number. I mean, we think it could easily be 250,000, uh, which I think was probably above consensus last I looked. Um, I, I don't know that I'm a big believer in that, though, Jonathan. I would stress I think that there are that there is some um, seasonal quirkiness going on here. I think once you get to the March number, I think that's probably when you um, start to sort of scale back. The other thing I would highlight is I know everyone made a big deal about average hourly earnings. I hate average hourly earnings, honestly. It's like it's just such a, such an incomplete measure of wage dynamics. Why, Tom? Um, Why? I've always at average, uh, because so average weekly earnings is a better way of thinking about this. Average weekly earnings takes into account not just average hourly earnings, but how many hours you work. So if you actually had a, a setup where hours fell um, by more than average hourly earnings rose, then average weekly earnings was down. And that's exactly what happened last month. So. Um, to me, that's the right way of, of thinking about wages, and that's what we'll be focused on. Interesting, Tom. Love that. It's going to catch up, sir. It's going to see you. It's been too long. Tom Porcelli there of PGM breaking down the jobs data. 140 a little bit early this morning, 140K in the ADP report. The estimate was 150. Looking ahead to payrolls later on this week on Friday, 200K there is the median in our survey. So that's the consensus call, if you will. We're looking for 250 over at PGM. If you're just catching up with us, we got some prepared remarks from Chairman Powell as well. These are the comments we've had from the chairman going into this testimony on Capitol Hill. Day one in front of the House Financial Service Committee, a little bit later this morning, 10 a.m. Day two tomorrow in front of the Senate Banking Committee. Here are the quotes for you. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain and ongoing progress towards our 2% inflation objective is not assured. Lisa, again, this word confidence coming from the chairman, a lack thereof. 
And what's going to give them that confidence? Remember all those times we were asking, is anyone going to ask them that? Are they going to give any insight into that? And the answer is no. And basically, we're probably not going to today. And probably no one will even ask them about that. But that really is the key question. What will be the threshold to get them over and have that confidence? I hope that question is asked. Otherwise, what's the point? Equity Futures gone into the opening bow, 46 minutes away. Futures are positive and this session highs up by 0.5%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The U.S. government is pressing allies to further tighten restrictions on China's access to chip technology. Washington wants the Netherlands, Germany, South Korea and Japan to limit Chinese access to exports and repairs of specialized chemicals and equipment critical for making semiconductors. Sources say Tokyo and The Hague have reacted coolly to the latest push, arguing they want to access the impact of current, assess rather the impact of current curbs. Senator Bob Menendez has been indicted again in connection with an ongoing bribery. Federal prosecutors added obstruction of justice charges to existing criminal counts against Mendez and his wife. Many Democrats have called on the New Jersey senator to step down after he was initially indicted last September. Meanwhile, independent Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema has announced she won't run for a second term. Her decision ends the possibility of a turbulent race in one of the nation's most politically competitive states. Wells Fargo is set to unveil a new credit card aimed at competing with the Chase Sapphire Preferred program. Sources tell us the firm is planning to add $95 per year travel-focused card to its roster as soon as this week. Wells Fargo will also add transfer partners, including Air France, British Airways, and Choice Hotels to its reward pro platform for the first time. The new card is part of the CEO Charlie Scharf's mission to make Wells Fargo a bigger player in the consumer space. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. At this point, why doesn't a bank just buy an airline? Or why doesn't an airline just buy a regional bank? 100%. You know, why don't they just I get it done? I think about this all the time. Same industry. What get is it, this get it over with. Exactly. I mean, are we flying something or are you basically flying a credit card? Stop pretending you're in the flying business. Exactly. Buy spirit. <laughs> or not. Well, I don't know. Well, let's see. They maybe, let that maybe they'll ask know. about that on Big ideas Hill. coming up on this show. <laughs> up next, Chair Powell, day one. We've gotten strong data, but we want to look at things not just one month, but we want to look at them more holistically. What I'm watching for is the risk that they're reaccelerating. And right now, I still see that risk of reacceleration as fairly low. A preview coming up next, Chairman Powell, about one hour, 15 minutes away on Capitol Hill. Celebrating the good old days just around the table. <laughs> the days when Steve Rusciuto had to go down to Washington, D.C. to watch the testimony himself because there was no internet. Yeah. Went streaming it. Go, go to the public records. <laughs> get I was saying I heard some great stories about that. I remember covering the ECB and the old Bundesbank reporters talking about how they used to go to the decision and then run to the payphone. Gen Z's watching thinking, like, what are they talking about? <laughs> what is a payphone? <laughs> Payphones? <laughs> Under surveillance this morning, Chair Powell, day one. We've gotten strong data, but we want to look at things not just one month, but we want to look at them more holistically. And so I think what you're seeing is you're seeing inflation that has come down a lot. Core PCE and headline PCE both have two handles on them as it relates to the year over year rates. I mean, that is a lot of progress from just a year ago. What I'm watching for is the risk that they're reaccelerating. And right now, I still see that risk of reacceleration as fairly low. Here's the latest. Powell set to speak in just over an hour in front of the House Financial Services Committee. The Fed chair saying in prepared remarks, quote, we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for the tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain and ongoing progress towards our 2% inflation objective is not assured. Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho with us around the table for more. Steve, we won't talk about the good old days. We'll talk about the next couple of hours <laughs> down on Capitol Hill. What are you expecting from the Fed chair? Uh, he's got to walk a fine line. He knows he has to walk a fine line. He's capable of doing it. The problem really becomes when he gets off into the weeds. You know, when he's answering a question and he starts to deviate from script, then the Jerome Powell comes out that the market loves. And that's a Jerome Powell that wants to maximize social welfare. It's a Jerome Powell that really likes the idea of keeping the labor market tight as long as the markets allow them to do it. And let's be honest, where 10-year notes are right now is telling you the market's inflation expectations are still anchored. So there's more likely that if he's going to skew towards 
two rather than four, rather than three, or four rather than three. I think there's more likely Jerome Powell's inside nature leads him towards four. You've touched on something really quite revealing. Are you saying that Chairman Powell instinctively just wants to make people happy? Because that's what we've heard on this program before. I don't think he wants to make people happy. I think he looks at his job and his dual mandate, and the dual mandate essentially requires the Fed to maximize social welfare. If you think about it, we want full employment and low inflation. That's maximizing social welfare. And he really takes that seriously. And to a great extent, let's look at where we are. We've got an economy where the labor market is tight, been tight for a very long period of time. We've got a market where inflation expectations are low and they remain low. Um, and yields as a result of the long end of the curve remain low. So why wouldn't you be happy? To me, to a certain extent, this is a bit of a victory lap for them. They're getting what they want. Why upset the apple cart? I feel like this is kind of kabuki theater. Everyone's talking about the Fed's uh, testimony, but no one actually cares. Why does no one care about this particular testimony? Well, I think the whole nature about this particular testimony is the fact that we know at the end of the day there's going to be a meeting very soon. And at that meeting, we're going to have a new summary of economic projections. We're going to have new dots. So a lot of what comes out of this is believed to be sort of old information. We don't expect them to cut new ground in here, where a few weeks from now, we're going to be cutting new ground. In fact, the Fed is going to distribute to all the primary dealers later this week, if not today, the questions that they want us to answer before they go into their deliberations. So everyone knows and is waiting for that, and everyone's waiting for payroll employment. So this is kind of like responding to old news. It's a little bit like the JOLTS data. You know, it's January JOLTS. We know the labor market was tight in January. So the probabilities are the JOLTS data for January will be healthy numbers. So, and forgive me, but then what will JOLTS this market, right? If we're looking right now at data points that are backwards looking and that are confusing, you've got Fed officials who are basically not telling us anything. What will give us some sort of lodestar to kind of guide to some new economic narrative that sticks for longer than three minutes? Um, I, I don't think you're going to get that until you get closer and closer to results of the election. To be honest with you, the period we're in right now kind of reminds me of the period um, w w that we had during uh, George Sr. Bush as president. He had done a lot of the fundamental work to bring long-term rates down. But the market didn't care. The market just kept long-term real rates high. And that was one of the reasons why he lost the election. And the reality is when Bill Clinton came along and changed the fiscal narrative, suddenly we all cared and long-term rates dropped and we had the Bill Clinton economy. That followed on the backdrop of it. Today, I'm sitting here, real rates are very, very low. Overall nominal rates are very, very low. We have a fiscal budget that's out of control. I think once we get into the narrative of what's really going to happen with fiscal policy with the next administration, and we begin to realize that both of these people are going to spend money, and they start talking about tax cuts on top of a $1.6 trillion deficit, that's when I think the real long end of the curve, the real yield to the long end of the curve, could turn around and say, wait a second, guys, there's a problem here. If we have to wait for the election to understand the fiscal picture, should Jay Powell also wait till the election to know when or not to cut rates? I, that's a hard question. I don't think the economy is going to give him an opportunity to cut rates. Let me just put it to you that way. I think they want to cut rates. They really are uncomfortable with rates being above 5%. Uh, but I don't think they're in a rush to do it. And I don't think the economy is going to give them the excuse to do it. So I think you wind up in an environment where we will probably spend all year pushing out the rate cuts. All year pushing out the rate cuts. But they're always going to promise them to you. And Somebody you think we'll end up with what? You think we'll end up with none? Uh, for this year, that's our call. We have none priced in. I have none priced in because I don't know when they can start. And if I don't know when they can start, how can I figure out how many they're going to put in? Because the data is just not there. Interesting. Team Torsten Slock of Apollo joins with Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho. Yeah, well, I'm just sitting here wondering when the treasury market cares, what will it take to sort of care in terms of level? In other words, what level do you see it jumping to? <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you look at where real yields should be in an environment of a $1.9 trillion structural deficit, as opposed to a $1.6 trillion, let's say round it up to $2 trillion structural deficit, you're looking at real yields that should at least be 100 basis points higher than they are today. So, I mean, eventually I think there will be that step up. Uh, right now, the biggest risk that the market faces is the market gets the sense eventually that 2% isn't really the real target. Maybe they're willing to accept 25 Yeah. And if they wind up accepting 25 or that's where we bottom out, then again, the curve may actually steepen from the long end 
rather than from the front end as everyone has been anticipating. And that, I think, is the other short-term risk to worry about. Steve, I could kick around this conversation with you all day. This was great. It's great to see you. Steve Ashuda of Mizuho looking for no rate cuts in 2024. Here's your tomorrow. The lineup looks like this. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. Christina Campmany of Invesco, the brilliant, legendary Howard Marks of Oak Tree and Bank of America's Michael Gapin. That's tomorrow. Chairman Powell coming later this morning from New York City. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.